Welcome to Hunt Harvest Health, the podcast with your host, Ryan Lampers, a.k.a. The Stealthy Hunter. Howdy. And myself, Dr. Hillary Lampers, where we share our love for ancestral living and the health topics of the modern age. Ryan is the well-rounded bearded brawn of Hunt Harvest Health. His knowledge of backcountry adventure, western hunting, and our household status as garden guru and super dad really defines our gut stealthy lifestyle. Doc Hillary is definitely the brains and beauty behind all of this. She kind of makes everything happen as I have zero technical skills. Hill is just a wealth of knowledge in all things medicine and nutrition, which not only keep our family healthy, but they help me stay strong in all my mountain adventures. You can follow us at huntharvesthealth.com, Instagram, and Facebook for more podcasts, recipes, and stories. Welcome back to the 50th Hunt Harvest Health episode. Yes, folks, this is number 50. I'm Doc Hillary. I'm here with Ryan. Yep. Yep. And we are on take number six. (laughs) It's been a ridiculous night of interruptions and babies and kiddos knocking over the (laughs) cameras and all that fun stuff. So Mm -hmm. this podcast is Dr. Ben Lynch, and he is the author of the new book coming out the end of this month called Dirty Jeans. Ryan. Dirty Jeans. (laughs) We were talking about dirty jeans, and I was thinking, man, if nobody knows what we're really talking about, they're just trying to figure out why we're talking about dirty jeans. It's not this like redneck thing where a bunch of folks walking around with dirty jeans. (laughs) No. Blue jeans. There's Explain probably rednecks out what there with dirty jeans. Dirty is because he wrote a book about it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, dirty jeans refers to dirty genetics. And uh, in his book, he talks about the seven genes that we all have and how they influence different organ systems in our body and how they can get dirty through lifestyle choices, basically. Just a quick introduction to the podcast we did with him is I graduated with Dr. Ben in 2007 from Bastyr University. We're friends and he went on to kind of conquer the world of genetics. And in the last 10 years, he's really created an empire around helping people understand and clean up their genetics for this generation and for future generations. I've had my genetics done, but Ryan hasn't. And so we talked some in here about different genes and how he thinks Ryan, what Ryan might have, what Ryan might have based on his personality. So it was kind of fun to go through this and it is a bit of a long podcast, but I really enjoyed it. It goes by really fast and it's a great conversation with somebody who's super smart and just wants to share his mission with the world. The second part of this is, is that after that podcast, He said, hey, guys, I'm going to be launching my book in January, and I'm going to be doing what's called the Dirty Jeans Summit. And I'd like you to come on and talk about the Hunt Harvest Health lifestyle, especially hunting, because a lot of people don't understand hunting um, in our community. And, you know, we we understand that. And those of you who are out there listening to us, you 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 do understand. But, you know, 80 percent of the population maybe doesn't really understand or know much about it or have an opinion. And so this is a, we, we jumped on this to be yeah, on this podcast. It's a great opportunity because um, talking with Ben and again, Ben is a super smart dude and uh, you know, he can have a conversation with somebody like me cause he can dumb it down pretty easily. Luckily, fortunately for me, so I can understand him, <laughs> but um, no, this is a, it's, it's pretty cool cause he's got a curiosity. He's kind of seen what we do, how we involve hunting and gardening and all this kind of food stuff in our, into our lives and try to get a little more self-sufficient and, you know, get healthy with the food that we take in. And he also sees this other side of very health conscious people who talk a lot about food and health and all this, but they maybe are a little bit, you know, maybe they're curious, maybe they just don't understand it. Maybe they could be educated a little bit on it. And that's where we step in and hopefully we can talk to people and kind of explain why we do and what we do and how we do it. Mm -hmm. So um, great opportunity to kind of see, you know, talk to other people from not just our community, but different parts of, um, you know, other communities and and try to explain what 
what we do and how we do it. Yeah. Cool. And we're seeing a crossover happening. You know, we're feeling it. I think in this community, we're feeling it. I mean, it happened with me a couple of years ago and, you know, I've been married to Ryan for 20 years. It's like people are starting to understand. They're starting to realize that this, this, our, this lifestyle has value. And, you know, we just, we also realize that a lot of people don't know where to start. They don't really know where to start. So our mission with this, the, the, uh, interview we did with him was to help new people understand why, what they need to do, some of the simple, basic things. And then on top of it, we get into conservation. We talk about wildlife management. We talk about a lot of different topics that, um, I think the lay person doesn't really have any clue about and they're misinformed about. So it's pretty exciting for us because we're reaching a huge community outside of the hunting community and we're able to bridge it now so that you guys can have the benefit of learning about your genetics, learning about how to clean your genetics, how to use your lifestyle that you're already, you know, learning about and doing what we're doing and how that's actually benefiting you. So it's, it's pretty cool. And, and so to be quick, this is how it works. The Dirty Jeans Summit is seven days of speakers and we're talking high caliber. So Ryan and I are in there, but there's like Chris Kresser is in there. Um, Dr. Jillian is in there talking about gut health. Dr. Darren Ingalls is in there talking about Lyme disease. Uh, other people you may know. Uh, ben Greenfield is in. Uh, Sean Croxton. Multiple naturopaths, multiple MDs from from vaccinations to, you know, clean beauty products to all these things and how they influence their genetics. So it's seven days worth of speakers. If you go to huntharvesthealth.com slash dirty jeans summit. All the information will be there for you to go in and sign up and you can listen to these talks for free. If you listen to the talk within a 24-hour period of the day that it launches, you do not have to pay for anything, which is really cool. So you can sign up for free. You can listen for free. If you don't get to listen or you want recorded or you like are listening and you go, this is powerful information, you can buy the whole thing and you can have access to it for the rest of your life. So you can have that option. But we really encourage you to go sign up. We're on day five, and we're going to be talking about genetics and healthy families, and uh, which is a really strong piece of our platform. So, you know, seven days, like over 50 people, and we'd really love you to be a part of it. And we'd love you to share it with this community, share it with others that you know, share it on social media. And I know people hate to hear that, like, oh, they're asking us to share. But this is free, folks. Like, you don't have to pay anything for this. And Dr. Ben has spent countless months bringing together, like, some of these people. Good luck, you know, getting them on your podcast. I mean, he's worked really hard. He's developed an amazing community. And he wants us to be part of that. So, you know, just go and sign up and learn. And, and um, we'd love to have your feedback. So, Dr. Ben Lynch is on this podcast today. We were fortunate enough to get him to talk with us and share who he is kind of on a personal level. And we get to share who we are on a personal level with his community. So anything else, Beb? No, I think he covered it. And you can also get his book, Dirty Jeans. Not dirty jeans like redneck jeans, like dirty genetics. Dirty genetics. Just to clarify. Just to clarify. Bunch of smart people. <laughs> Bunch of smart people talking. Besides me. You're Somehow on there. I you are one there. of the smartest people on there. He's on there talking. He's getting smart, folks. Watch out. I'm getting smart by being <laughs> talking and listening to people. All right, let's do this. You know, when I first started getting into genetic testing and gen working with genetics, I was already a naturopathic physician. I'd already specialized in environmental medicine. I already knew the fundamentals of how to optimize our patient's health, right? For me, genetics was a tool to help optimize their performance, how to identify susceptibilities, why they were responding poorly to this or favorably to that. Right. Now everybody's going to the testing first and trying to prescribe treatment based upon a genetic SNP or a variant on the report and removing the patient altogether. It's, they're, they're focusing on a, a, a PDF. Right. And it's, you know, I always try to back people up and say, you first have to know what genes do, and they work. Genes do work. That's it. 
So if, if you're working your ass off and you're in a hot environment and you're wearing excessive amount of clothes and you're wearing a huge heavy backpack like Ryan does when he's hunting and competing. <laughs> yeah. And your performance is going to be okay for a little while, but then you're going to wane. And so if you're putting all this load on your jeans, they're not going to perform for you. So if you eat healthy, if you have the right tools and you're giving the body the right tools, then your genes are going to work regardless of the genetic variance that you have. To me, that is common sense. I asked my CEO of, of Seeking Health, my, my supplement company, I asked him, read this book, you know, read Dirty Genes. And he, he, he read it. And, and then he came, he, come up to, he came up to me about a month later and he, he goes, you know, I don't want to insult you, Ben. I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, I read the book cover to cover. I said, what do you think? He goes, two words. I said, what's that? He goes, common sense. Mm-hmm. I said, exactly. Exactly. So let's, let's get rid of, of all the science and confusion and fear and I'm a mutant or no, I've got this gene or I've got that gene and just back up and say, am I doing the basics that I need to do? Am I eating real food? Am I growing my own food? And I, am I preparing real whole food? Am I getting my shoes, shoes chewed on by your <laughs> dog? <laughs> you know? Town, yeah. Man. So you have laces. That's yeah. dangerous. So, you know, it's just the fundamentals do so much. And uh, people don't know what the fundamentals are. And I said, well, air, food, water, diet, environment, and your mindset. Do all that. Once you get that done, and you still want to optimize things, because we are born with personalities. I mean, you're right. more outgoing. Ryan's, you know, more into, how, how would you say it, Ryan? I'm an introvert. You're an introvert. I say it all the time. You know, I, I'm very comfortable not being in the limelight. I'm, I'm very comfortable in the back of the class. Um, that's how I am around people. That's how I am. You know, even by myself, I, I like to observe things and just pay attention and rattle these things in my thought, these thoughts in my head. Um, that's just how I, I have always been. I don't think I'll ever change. Where Hillary <laughs> is complete opposite of that. She's very outgoing. Um, and I think it does change a little bit as you age, I feel like. I feel like after childbirth, after having two children, and just the difference in energy level required to have children, and I don't know if you've noticed this in yourself or in your wife, it's like hormones change, things change. I don't feel as social as I used to feel. I feel um, like I want more of my quiet time that before I had kids, I took for granted. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like now I feel like, can I just get a little time to myself? So the thought of being social and, and going out and hanging out with people and doing that whole thing that I used to love to do, it's kind of changed for me. It's actually, I feel like sometimes it stresses me out more. Um, it's, it makes me more anxious or something. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not outgoing. It just means that um, I'm not quite as outgoing as I feel like I used to be. Well, you, you know yourself. You know that you need your time away to, to recharge. Yeah. Because you know, well, kids think, do suck it out of you. Well, you had kids in school. Mm. Uh, we didn't have kids in school. So we, we were married 11 years before we had kids. And we had our first daughter the year after graduation. We had her in 2009. We graduated in 2007, mm-hmm. right? You and I? Mm-hmm. So I had a lot of alone time. Like, you know, besides with my friends or in school or whatever. And still then, I think I just had a ton of alone time. Right. And I, I wasn't I think it just changes you when you have kids and you like have no time, especially women. Like in that first five, three to five years of a kid's life, like there is no privacy. Like you, unless you leave and your husband is great enough to give you that time alone, like you get zero privacy time alone. Yeah. But you're, you still are that social person. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're just drained. Yeah. So, and you know, in order to rebuild and re- get your energy back, you need quiet time. Yeah. Once you get that quiet time back, you're going to be all gung-ho again and social yeah. again. Yeah. You know, and yeah, it's different. I think, um, you know, what I've noticed in Hill is, you know, obviously with the kids, it's a lot more, you know, energized in the house. There's always a buzz. There's always stuff going on. So she, uh, at times, you know, when she hits a wall and she just needs that little break, it doesn't take her very much of a break. 
to kind of recharge, reset. I yeah. need a lot more time. I don't know why that is. I can't tell you why, but uh, it takes me a while to actually, you know, be out. My thing is going into the woods. Um, yeah. You know, whether I'm hunting or just fishing or hiking or whatever it is, and uh, and draining myself physically. That that is what I I actually require that yeah. to actually not be so grouchy. Yeah. She, she understands that. I think I've always been like that. She used to recognize it. Like if I didn't just get a go, hit a mountain and hit a trail. Yeah. I would be irritable. I'm the same as you. My wife is the same as you. Mm. And, uh, you know, the three, three boys, they're 15, well, 14, 12 and nine now, and they're doing 9 million things. And, uh, they all are doing different things at different times. So it's a, it's a big juggling act, but she's very social, but yeah, she needs her time to herself to, to, you know, recollect all that energy that she normally has so she can go out and enjoy friends and go dancing and hang out but yeah she needs to recharge but personality wise i think genetically we are pre-programmed i shouldn't say we're programmed we are our genes work at certain different speeds right Mm -hmm. so your speed for dopamine and serotonin is different than ryan's and mine's slightly different ryan's and everybody's dopamine and neurotransmitters are working at different rates. So if you're really outgoing, then, you know, your dopamine and serotonin levels are different than Ryan's. And for me, I have to be in nature a lot. And that's part of why I love living where I love, because I can just walk right out here at St. Edward's Park immediately out my door, mm-hmm. or I can go rowing, or I can just watch the in nature, and it's, it's great. You guys are in Granite Falls and get to connect with nature right there. Um, I always ask my boys, let's go for a hike, and they're like, oh, Dad, no. Um, or I have to chase a ball, you know, tennis, soccer, football, basketball. I need to move, and uh, otherwise I go bonkers, and I'm not fun to be around. Yeah. <laughs> Very similar. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I've got my, my, my oldest son, Tasman, his dopamine levels clear out pretty quickly. So he tends to be a more, more addictive personality in terms of uh, the kid loves fashion, which drives me nuts because I'm not into fashion at all, but he, he digs it. And uh, so, but that lower- Fashion just like- Different outfits and like clothes, well, super into that. Yeah, researching brands, researching oh, different yeah. shoes, what's coming out in the market, who's wearing what. <laughs> um, I was like, God, I could care less. Yeah. Um, and I said, you're so materialistic. And he goes, no, dad, I just like fashion. I was yeah. like, so I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to comprehend it, but it's, he likes it because fashion, I do believe, will spike your dopamine. If you wear something that's really nice and makes you feel good, then your dopamine goes up. Well, there's a reason people like to dress up, you know? I think that there's something to be said for that when you dress up. It's like prom. It's like the whole showy thing, right? Which Ryan always got out of. He never went to prom. I never know. I never either. (laughs) Nice jean. I don't have that jean. (laughs) But I think there is something to be said about, you know, when you get dressed up, you make yourself look nice. People comment. They're like, wow, you look so good. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about how dopamine works, it, makes sense, right? It's the same feeling as swiping on your Instagram. Ooh, look how many people like me. It makes your dopamine go up. So you could see why kids, especially because they're in that time of their life when looks are so important, it's really what attracts you to people if you think about it, right? Um, If somebody has a a desire for that kind of thing and that's increasing their dopamine, you can't really say to them, you couldn't really say, like, quit acting like that. Quit being so materialistic. All you care about is what you look like if that's something that makes him feel really good about himself, you know? That's one. How many times have you heard someone say to a sick person, wow, you look great? Right. It, never. Mm-hmm. Never. Yeah. So if you look great, you probably feel great. Right. But you can't, you can't look unhealthy and feel great. I mean, you might get that spike of, of you know, that... Big Mac or that fast food give you a little dopamine hit in your brain and made you, wow, I feel good. You know, the food scientists, they got to dial down, right? They know how to get you addicted to that food it, that hits that dopamine receptor. And you're like, oh, that's what we seek in life is, is a dopamine hit. Right. Um, you know, and we are programmed for that. 
But the reality is... But you know what's weird? The cool thing is, is once you get healthier, and I think once you do listen to your genes... That's your dopamine. You go to McDonald's and you eat it right. and you are like, this is so disgusting. Right. I feel so disgusting right now. Why would I even spend my money on that? Right. And it's a different place than if you're doing it every day. You don't, you don't necessarily know what that feels like, mm -hmm. which is very hard to describe to somebody who is sick. And diet is a big piece of it. And lifestyle is a big piece of it. It's very hard to say, well, don't worry. You'll feel good eventually. Because you and I know... It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And diet is so low force as far as on the medical scale of for low, you know, low versus high force. It's like, right, mm -hmm. high force is surgery and drugs, really, right? right? Like giving someone a statin is like high force. Mm -hmm. Telling somebody to go home and cut out all that extra sugar in their diet, and quit drinking a liter of soda a day, that's low force, but it's really difficult to do that. It takes time. It's much low, slower than a statin. Mm -hmm. And so that's where people, it's really hard as a physician to, I find this is the trap that you can get in as a physician is you're trying to be a cheerleader to get people to realize that someday they could actually feel good, but they have to do all the work. And you have to sometimes watch patients just, they don't want to do the work mm -hmm. and, or they just don't know what that feels like because they've never felt like that. Like their genes from day one have been assaulted. You know, yeah. getting getting clean is like, they just don't even understand that concept. So, yeah, and I, I always tell people in the beginning, they said, well, how do I clean my genes or how do I, how do I support my genetic health? I said, first, you need to be aware that your genes do work. So quit giving them so much work. Quit not, you know, quit staying up all night and quit binging on foods and quit exercising too hard and not giving enough, enough time to recover. So these are all simple things that you can do to support your genes without even having to spend a dollar. You mm -hmm. know, people, people think that if we're sick or if they're sick, they have to open a, a bottle and take something. That's right. the mindset. I'm sick. I need to pop a, you know, over-the-counter med or I need to pop a supplement or both. They never think, what lifestyle thing do I need to change? Because that requires change and effort. Mm -hmm. So, Ryan, if, if you sat at a desk job, say up in a high-rise building, downtown Seattle, yep. and you were doing investment banking, and you did it because you knew you could make you know, a seven-figure salary and you could wear your suit and all that, how long do you think it would take for you to get high blood pressure, pissed off, and possibly, you know, Drowning your sours and alcohol. Oh, I think it'd be day one. Yeah. To be quite honest. Uh, I, first off, I'd be terrible at investment banking. I'm not smart enough for that. But Stop. I would be absolutely miserable. Um, I have a horrible time just trying to stay seated for any amount of time. Um, that is, yeah. Yeah, I'd be depressed. Um, I'd feel like garbage. I'd probably go home and binge eat and, and not be happy in any way. And just think how many people are exactly like you who need high intense exercise, who need whole food, who need nature. Just that, but maybe not be aware of the benefit of those things. Yeah. As opposed to they've always been that way. They've always sat at that at that desk or, you know, never had the option to go get exercise or go hiking or you know. But everything's a choice. Right. Everything's a choice. And if you know your parents or your friends or your colleagues or what have you put that in your head like oh, what can I make the most money at? Because money is the American dream and we need to go chase it versus what makes me happy? What keeps me healthy? And I think as a society, especially in America, it's, it's get the house, get the cars, get the kids in special colleges and put their college sticker on your car and tell everybody that your kids are going there. And, you know, and then they're stuck in the, in the hamster wheel. So, and, you know, I keep telling my kids, look, Go to college if you want to go to college. Otherwise, travel, start your own business, do whatever. It, figure out who you are first before you pick any job or you pick any degree. And I think, you know, what you're doing, I know what you're doing, supports who you are. Because, I mean, I, I've been following you guys' Facebook page for, you know, a while. And your, your podcast is doing great. And, you know, you guys are the epitome of where I believe people should be going. 
but they're not because they're chasing the dollar instead. Yeah, I almost feel like, um, you know, when I'm out doing these things, and I've kind of written about it a little bit, is uh, like I, I know this secret. I've got this secret over a lot of society that I am aware of what I'm doing. And I got a bigger benefit than all these people that just don't know about it, yeah. haven't been exposed to it, unaware of it, whatever that is. But uh, yeah, I feel extremely lucky and beneficial that I grew up knowing that this was an option and mm -hmm. it was available. We've got public lands we can go out to and hike and chase critters and all mm -hmm. those different things. And, um, you know, I think, you know, where some people are raised, uh, like you said, they always have an option. It's always a choice. I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't even, they're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. They live in the city in an environment that they don't have any friends that have gone hiking. You know, it's kind of getting perpetuated now um, as we, you know, get these bigger cities and people just don't get out of them. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I just feel extremely lucky because my family, we're all aware of it. So we take advantage of it. We utilize it and it makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The happiest people that I've ever seen, you know, I've been to, I've been fortunate enough to, when I used to do landscape construction here in Seattle, I would take off in the winter or I would just take off for a whole year. And so I've been to about 50 countries and it was the first country that I ever went to was Fiji. And I went to some remote island and I lived with the islanders out there. And by societal standards, they had nothing in terms of material goods, but yet they had everything. They, their front yard was this amazing half moon bay with white sand and pristine blue water, mm. you know, that was just clear and at night you can run your hand through it and brilliant phosphorescence would show up everywhere and uh it was remarkable and he was a spear fisherman and he'd go out and spear fish and and then he would trade with the uh, other islanders and you know he would trade the fish for some taro root or some kava or whatever and they would they had i asked him when he walked up these gardens and i said how do you know which land is yours and he was like what do you mean and he goes well it's it's community garden we just, you know, I tend to this, I grow this part, and then we trade. And there's no money. It's just, it's just all community support. I think, ah, oh, that was really cool. And on Sundays, they did nothing. Well, the women worked hard. <laughs> yeah. The men and the kids, they, they just played on the beach in a, a phenomenal environment that people die for. You know, they right. die for that area. But yet they had no money. They had no running water. They had no electricity. They slept on a mat. But you see what we think is... But they had everything they needed. Everything. Right. And they were so happy. And what we think in this culture is, okay, wow, that sounds amazing. Let's go to Fiji, but let's build a $2 million house on the beach and let's put a fence around it so nobody can come in and steal my stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'll have this beautiful place all to myself. And I think that's what these cultures show us is, is that... And Ryan and I are still learning this too, because... Ryan and I traditionally are, we don't, ha we didn't have a huge community because for a lot of years, him and I didn't agree on a lot of things. We had different communities. I had the Bastyr community. I spent a lot of my years here at Bastyr and then I went into work in, in that community and he had his family and his kind of tight knit friends and that was it. And when we came to start seeing, once we had children, we started seeing like how we needed to blend our way of life and how some of the things weren't working for us, weren't working for our relationship. And then when I actually came to accept him for who he was, instead of trying to change him into that guy that was an investment banker working in a high rise to make us money, when I came to that realization, then all of a sudden it was like we started to realize what is actually most important. Mm -hmm. And that's when we decided to do this. And that's when we also started building a community of people, like-minded people that don't just want to revolve their life around that. They think there's things in their life that they find very essential for living. And so I think this is the culture that we've come into. This whole thing is like, obtain all this stuff and then what do you do with it? And what those people in Fiji are showing you is, is that if you don't have community, if you can't share, if you don't have anybody to barter with or to share the fruits of your labor, what's the point? There you know, like for Ryan, he's very introverted and he needs that time alone. But 
he's not really alone. He's going out in the mountains and he's hanging out with animals. And if he does get an animal, he spends like days with that animal, even though the animal's clinically dead. He has taken that animal from a live thing down to meat in a bag, down to the heart. I mean, we eat the heart. We eat these pieces of this animal and he is so connected to that animal. And there's a story behind every time we eat that meat, there's a story that he will always have within him. So he's not really alone, alone. Hmm. He's just alone from people, you know? And I think that that he needs that in order to be a better person in the community. And I think that that's what we're missing. We're missing that alone time to know who we are. And then we're missing that greater community that really wants us for who we are, not trying to change us into somebody else. Right. And I think it's very, well, I know it's very easy for us to get sucked into the, the quote unquote American dream quickly. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I was in India, I, I would spend about a dollar a day there and that went a long way. Granted, I didn't stay in very nice places or, Mm -hmm. or eat a very good food. Um, and I would get sick, but, um, you know, it was it was very telling for me that a dollar can go a long way and to respect that dollar. And then you come home and you respect it for a little while and then all of a sudden the marketing starts hitting you and you feel that you need to buy something because it's not the latest trend or, you know, people are judging you based upon what you have or don't have. And it was, it was a big... Was, and so every time I... I start seeing myself saying, I need to get something else or I need to buy something else. It's like, okay, I need to unplug from here and I need to implant myself back into a, another area. That's why I enjoy going to Russia. You mm. know, where my, my in-laws are, they're, you know, they're monetarily poor, but emotionally very rich. And, you know, money is, money does provide freedom. I do appreciate that mm-hmm. immensely, but it, definitely does not buy happiness. And we hear that all the time. Yeah, it's interesting. As we talk about this, I'm thinking about, you know, there's been certain things. um, People ask, why do you love what you do so much? Why do you love it in the hills? Why do you love hunting? And uh, and I'm just thinking about, you know, this basic needs um, thing that we're talking about. One thing about it, when you go in the hills, especially alone, is there really, it boils down to three basic needs. It's food, water, and shelter. You go in with the tent on your back. Um, Water is of utmost importance. It's a huge factor in your survival back there, and so is food. And you're trying to pull food back out of those hills. So it's almost, uh, it's primal in a way, because you're you're basically going back to how we used to be. Those were the important issues. It had nothing to do with money or climbing any ladders or, you know, showing what you had off. Um, So in a way, it's... it's, uh, It's happiness that I think probably people used to have before all this material stuff that kind of clutters our heads now. Well, they used to celebrate the harvest. They used to celebrate the the kill. And, you know, that it's all gone. Yeah. You know, we have Thanksgiving, but that's just a commercial thing too. Yeah, you and I uh, spoke a little bit about um, hunting and, and about meat, you know, the aspect of... Uh, how that's how people used to go out and do it. Families used to go out. Towns used to shut down. I don't think there's too many out there that do that now. But, uh, you know, communities communities used to shut down for the, you know, basically the whole family would go and, and go out and harvest deer, especially Midwest, and bring that back. And one of those key components to that, which is um, basically getting eroded away, with society today is families used to do that they used to go out together they used to do the hunt um go out in uncomfortable you know conditions sometimes and um you know hike and sweat and do all this stuff together as a family get an animal bring it back prepare it and that kind of showed everybody kids included you know where all that came from where all their you know their food that they're eating they're taking into their bodies came from there's not a whole lot of that anymore except for hunters like hardcore guys that actually do that but still it's not a deal where everybody goes out as a family and does it oh it's today i listened to a podcast with chris cresser i noticed he he um is it chris cresser who gave you an acknowledgement on your book am i saying his name right yep 
I listened to a podcast with him and Rob Wolf, and they're talking about ancestral diets and ancestral living and this new fad that's kind of come up in ancestral. I don't, I don't even really know what it means, but I guess people eating and living more ancestrally. Exactly. Uh, and I feel like we've always lived like that. We Being with Ryan, you just kind of do. You know, we've never bought meat. I've never bought meat. Unless my, we want chicken or something exotic, you know, once in a while I'll buy chicken. And I'm like, why did I buy <laughs> That's this? That's funny. You Gross. classify chicken as exotic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. It's so tasteless. I don't even like to buy it. My daughter likes chicken noodle soup once in a while, so I'll make it for her. But so you're just telling me you don't like animals raised in cages her whole life given arsenic and antibiotics? No. No. We try to avoid that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, it's. I think that what people are, when I hear ancestral lifestyle and paleo and like all these things, I people want to go back to just what you so talked you. about in the very beginning. Yeah, There's something like- about that that is that brings you back to community. It brings you back to the bare necessities. It brings you back to being like a human living on the planet that has to provide for yourself and not have things just handed to you like through a window or, you know, like... It's there's a piece of us that need that. Like it's like our genetics need that in order for us to have some sort of fulfillment. And when we don't get that, we see this like I feel like that's what causes so much strife, especially among peoples. It's like there's just not that you're not suffering enough well, was, <laughs> in this culture. Well, there's been a huge connection lost. And you know, food yeah. is obviously it's one of the most important pieces to survival in life. And uh that's the connection that, you know, most of us outdoorsmen, we're still, we're still very connected there. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of folks, you go to the grocery store and you see what they're throwing in their cart and it's sad. It's scary because, oh man, I mean, it's not real. It's not real food. It's box, it's sugar, it's, it's carb, everything, um, processed, everything. It's slow death. It is. And it's, Man, it frustrates me every time. And it doesn't matter what grocery store you go into, you see it. You see those shopping carts rolling around with nothing but soda and chips. And yeah. I mean, I, I we went into a, a, a Safeway or something because they had a, what's the smoothie store that people go to? And Jamba, get, Jamba Juice. Jamba Juice. Yeah, there's yeah. a Jamba Juice in there that one of my sons after a soccer game wanted to get one. So we go in there and wait in line. And it's right before a Seahawks game. Mm-hmm. And man, everybody's walking around in their jerseys and it's, you know, well, that's cool. And and they're all obese. And their carts are full of TV garbage snacks. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're guilty of it, but I would say uh, not very guilty of it. I mean, we're generally having, yeah, we may have a bag of chips or something like that. Yeah. And some dip or salsa, but it's also going to go with something probably like a burger. That's like splurging. A burger, but it's it's probably an elk burger. It's probably a venison <laughs> yeah. burger. Yeah. And there's a bunch of veggies. <laughs> there's a bunch of greens from the, garden. from the garden. Like Most people will be like, gross. Well, that's the, that's the other thing, too. Everything I mean, in moderation. If we have a bag of chips every uh, other Seahawks Sunday, we're probably still going to make it. You're doing good. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as I talk about, as I say in there, when you have a party, enjoy it. Eat a lot. Uh, drink with your friends, stay up all night, you know, be loud and, you know, be in a stuffy room and sweaty and don't get fresh air and wake up in the morning and feel kind of off and not your best. But you know what? Celebrate that you had a phenomenal evening with a lot of good friends, maybe some good food, maybe not. But the point is you had fun. So relish that and say, all right, today, you know, now I'm going to clean up the house and today I'll clean my jeans. I dirtied them last night. You know, I had chips and salsa last night. I don't eat I don't eat perfect. I don't feed my kids perfect. You know, we go out to dinner, I'll get them a soda. And I do that because it's life. We yeah. we live in America. I cannot raise them in a box mm-hmm. to not have soda or or these foods. I mean, my oldest, he will have Chick-fil-A after soccer games or soccer practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sucks. You know, I'm not happy about it, but I'm not going to bash him for it. He gets acne on his face. I'm like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, you know, it's his choice. Right. And so it, when we say we eat foods that we know we shouldn't, then we're guilty of that. Or we stay up all night. Yeah, we're guilty of that. Right. What's worse then? Is it the food that you ate and you're staying up all night or the guilt that you feel from it? So just eliminate the guilt 
and enjoy it. You know, I stayed up last night watching this stupid series uh, about nar- Narcos on Netflix. Because oh. <laughs> I'm totally fascinated with the whole cocaine oh, yeah. drug industry and how it's going on. And it's very educational. You know, it's a true story. Hmm. But it's, it's, it's a series. Mm-hmm. And I hate series because I get addicted. It I have to watch the in. next one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I woke up this morning and was like, God. Damn it, I'm so stupid. I was like, no, <laughs> you enjoyed it. It was good. Yeah. Now go to bed on time today. Yeah. We used to do a lot of that before we had kids. We'd start something. We'd just like watch eight episodes a night or something. Yeah. It's easy to do that now with Netflix. You used to not be able to do that. You know, you had to buy HBO and you had to wait every week for like The Sopranos to yeah. come out. That was years ago when we were in med school. You know, Sopranos was big. It's like we have to wait every Sunday night to get The Sopranos. Right. But you can't do You can binge now. It's like binge eating. You can binge watch TV. Well, that's exactly how we do it because we, we don't watch TV at all. We don't have it. We have yeah. Netflix. Mm-hmm. Netflix. So when we do sit down as a family and we do watch something, yeah, it's usually like a binge night, <laughs> of like four or five episodes all in a row. Um, but it's not that often that we do that. Okay. So I'm going to actually introduce who you are. So oh, yeah. people on this podcast will know <laughs> who you are. are we talking to here? <laughs> so I, uh, today we are interviewing Ben Lynch. She's, um, a naturopathic physician that I went to school with. We graduated the same year from our alma mater, Bastyr University. He is, a, as I already said, he's a naturopathic physician like I am. Uh, he also got a BS in cell and molecular biology from the University of Washington. And he's traveled all over the world. Uh, he, I know you worked with Mother Teresa in India. You've worked in Australia, like in the outback. As a cowboy, or what do they call him in uh, Jackaroo. Australia? Jackaroo. Yep. Uh, like you said, you've been in over 50 countries, and you worked in landscaping uh, construction for a long time before you went to medical school. Mm-hmm. He is a father of three boys, so his life is very busy. And on top of all this, he decided, oh, I don't know, it's probably about the time we got out of med- medical school, that he was going to do some research into this little kind of unknown gene at the time, at least for the most of us physicians, it was it was being researched, but most people, we weren't talking about mm-hmm. it all, the MTHFR gene. There's probably some of you out there listening who have heard that, the MTHFR, probably from your healthcare practitioner. You've had some testing done. Um, ben was really a pioneer in MTHFR. He has the largest methylation website, mthfr.net, which you can go to and get almost every single aspect of what that means. Um and information on that. And he's also into uh, methylation defects and genetic control. Recently, he has written a book that's going to be coming out in January or February? January. January. February. Yeah, uh, called Dirty Genes. And that is based on his work, obviously, with MTHFR, methylation defects, as well as taking a deep dive into many other genetic SNPs, which I'll let him talk about here in a little bit, but basically he's, he wants to help people improve their genetics. And what we like about it is improving their genetics through lifestyle um, and common sense stuff, right? He's also the um, CEO of seekinghealth.com, which is a supplement company um, that has many different uh, supplements that deal with methylation as well as pregnancy, all kinds of stuff. It's a great supplement line. I highly suggest you check it out. And then he also has a genetic, uh, what would you call it? It's, it's an assessment tool called Stratagene. And Stratagene can take your genetic information from something like 23andMe, and it can help to titrate it down to the most relevant genetic things that could be going on in your life and in your health. Mm-hmm. Does that, does that cover it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Plus well, he lectures all over the world. Very he, well-rounded. Yeah. He <laughs> is very busy. Let's put it that way. And he's super smart. I've been trying to catch up on some of the talks that you've been given here in the last week. And, uh, like I was telling Hill, it's very intimidating walking in here because I'm surrounded by smart people, <laughs> very smart people. And uh, yeah, most of the things that you guys are talking about are so far over my head, but uh, I'm starting to slowly pick up little bits and pieces and, and put it together as far as what you're doing. It's very interesting. Awesome. Yeah, because it's, it's about reaching your potential. That's it. You know, because 
if you're out there, like you were telling me earlier, if you're out there hunting and you're exercising and you try to shoot, you know, with a bow, you know, a, a pissed off bull, you know, 17 yards away from you and you're freaking out, you're not going to hit it or it's going to hit you. What do you guess his CMT gene is? I think he's probably plus plus. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. So, yeah, what gene? <laughs> we don't know what the COMT gene is, and I'm going to ask Ben about a few Dopamine. of the top ones. Okay. But COMT gene, maybe you can explain it a little bet because I think it – I actually brought my strategy and test today, which right. is interesting that you could maybe just peek at. But, Ryan, uh, years ago I did my 23andMe back when they were actually giving you your, like, medical information that mm -hmm. they had to stop doing it. Me and my older daughter had it done. He had a kit. He never did. I just threw the kit away. I think we've had it for like eight years. He never, seven years. I do years. that too. I he never tests. did it. He collect tests. So today he's like, how do you test your genes? And I said, Duh, that kit I had for years. Once you start learning genetics, when I start learn, looking at my genetics, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. And you can almost in a way meet people and learn and, and get to know them and learn their personality and Almost in a way, you can kind of guess what some yes, of their SNPs are, right? For sure. Um, so, okay, first, maybe tell us what a SNP is. A SNP. Okay. Yeah. First, genes, genes genes are made up of, a, you know, of DNA, right? Right. And every gene has its own series of DNA. Imagine we have we have twenty six letters in our alphabet. Our DNA has four letters, and how you rearrange those four letters will alter the shape of the gene in such a way it'll change its action. So if you arrange one of those four letters slightly different than what's typical, it could alter the function of the gene. So for example, if I, you know, have a shovel and I have a flat tip shovel for, you know, shovel and gravel on, on a driveway, that's great. But if I'm trying to dig a hole and plant a tree, for the flat tip shovel, I'm not going to have a hard time, right? Unless it's sand. Right. So it's the same thing with SNPs. You can have a slight misspelling in a gene, and it can alter the function of its of itself. So when that happens, it can be a benefit, and it could be a detriment. It could also just be fine and be increase your susceptibility to something. So the, the genes that I work with and the SNPs that I work with are fine. They're not going to kill you. They just are important to know what they, how they work. So if I've got two shovels on the wall, a round point and a flat point, you know, a flat head, then I want to know how they work and how I can use them. So for someone's dopamine, they can have a gene for dopamine that's a round point, or they can have a, a dopamine gene that's a flat shovel. And if you know which one you have, then you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. So they're not bad, you know, because you look at your strategy and report and you see yeah. pluses, you see minuses, you see yeah. pluses and minuses, you'll see red and green and yellow. You, you look at the red because that's where we gravitate to. I'm going to change all the colors on here because yeah. I don't like the red because red means fear and danger. Yeah. It's not something you should be scared about. It should be just something that you need to understand which gene you have so you can optimize it. So what CMT do you have? Okay, so let I me, have... Let me guess. Yeah. Let me guess here. First, explain what COMT is. Good point. <laughs> so COMT is basically when you... Genes have long names. So COMT is just a bunch of science terms. It, it doesn't even matter. Um, it's catechol methyltransferase. But that aside, you know, they're just acronyms. Okay. Okay. Like ABC News. Mm -hmm. So COMT is an acronym. And its job is to process estrogen, part of it. Mm -hmm process dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Mm -hmm. So dopamine keeps you thinking, keeps you happy, keeps you seeking pleasures. Norepinephrine, epinephrine keep you focused and alert. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this on our blog. Uh, we did a whole thing on the hunting cascade of dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Like the focus that it takes to hunt and how those hormones work through the whole cascade. So That's right. We've talked about that some, but we yeah. didn't talk about COMT specifically. But. Yeah. So to put it in perspective of a hunter, if you've got a, if you think, well, let's, let's break this down. Let's, let's try to keep it very simple because simple means you can, 
take action on it, make it practical, right? So if COMT's job is to, to break down dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and some components of estrogen, what do you think it would happen, Ryan, if that COMT's gene was slightly slower? What would happen to your dopamine levels and your norepinephrine levels if it was functioning at a slower rate? Um, I wouldn't be able to do what I need to be doing up there. I'm assuming, I mean, <laughs> no, well, no, no. What well, would happen to dopamine? What would happen to your dopamine? Oh, if it's functioning more slowly, I would lose it. It'd drop. Mm. Right. No. So if you're if you're if the COMT gene, if mm -hmm. its job is to eat up the dopamine, okay, and it's not working as fast, what would happen to your dopamine? It would build up. Exactly. Exactly. It'd be overloaded with dopamine. That's right. And so being overloaded with dopamine is good so you can be focused okay. and aware and not have that addictive personality. But at the same time, if you have too much dopamine and you got that raging bull coming at you, you can get all anxious. Because oh, the I breakdown gotcha. product of dopamine is norepinephrine. Yeah. Which That's gives that. you the shakes, which they call, what do they call that? Uh, hunters. Oh, buck fever. Buck fever. Yeah. When you start shaking oh, and you okay. can't stop. Yeah, and that's yeah. interesting because um, I've never had that. I mean, I have, yeah, but a lot of people do. They mm -hmm. get the they get the shakes and they get so nervous and so jacked. He's up. never had that with a bull with a thousand pound animal seventeen yards from him. Okay, then I would. Most people would freak out but and run. I did just have an experience with a bear. I that was adrenaline overload. Um, I just shot a bull, a bear came down and I sprayed it in the face and it was just like so much. Yeah. My hands were shaking. Yeah. But I've never had that, um, type of adrenaline rush on anything. Else. Are you a thrill seeker? Do you like thrill? Do you, do you like putting yourself in it? Uh, you know, like bungee jumping and jumping out of nope. planes. No. And, okay. No. Does that scare you? Yes. Okay. It does. Okay. When you were younger, you and did more, but you weren't, he's never been a thrill you seeker. You know why it scares me? Because he I could am, hurt himself. Yeah. He now I think hurt. about, well, if I do that and I screw up an ankle or I screw right. up something or I blow a shoulder. But when you were younger, when you were younger, affect my passion. When you were younger, like, before you had to worry about mortgages and archery. Oh, yeah. I was motorcycle riding and doing stupid exactly. stuff all the time. Yeah. Right. Different. I was on my parents' health insurance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it didn't matter because he just matter. missed school. He's not a thrill seeker. Like he is not like he has to be doing that to be happy. No. Okay, let's let's never been like that. Let's ask this question then. So if you are you going out there hunting and you're you're walking and you're you're just going along, you're fine, right? You chilled out. Do you tend to feel better and more clear headed when there is a bull raging at you? Or do you tend to be more anxious when that happens? I mean, just a little bit more anxious. Or do you just tend to be like, okay, I'm alert. I'm going to handle this situation. Or like, oh shit, that's coming at me quick. I need to handle this. Yeah, I do get more anxious a little bit for sure because I know I have to be. I have to, um, I have to observe everything. I have to make the correct decisions. So I have to be kind of hyper vigilant about all the moves that I have to take to make sure that I get that animal. So I would say, because... There's, there's three types of, of, well, we're keeping this super boiled down and simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, dopamine metabolism in the brain is very complex. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's multiple genes at play. We're just talking about one here. So, I mean, there's dopamine transport moving around. There's dopamine receptors and how it gets bound to their genes and gets, you know, into the cell and all that. So we're just talking about one, but there's three speeds for dopamine with this one gene, COMT. It can be slow. And slower means you got more dopamine, more norepinephrine, more epinephrine. And as a result, you can be very uh, alert, very type A, very driven, um, work yourself into the ground, night owl. Uh, also, but when tests come or dangerous situations come or a police stops you, you get very irritable and crazy and anxious, and it takes you a long time to calm down. Okay. Now, if you have a, a faster ability to move your dopamine, norepinephrine, epi out, then you're a pretty laid back kind of person. You might have a lot of interests and hobbies. You might tend to be labeled as ADHD. You, your friends love you. Um, when you're put in a stressful situation, you perform well. So you might not do your homework well. You might hate reading books, but if your test is put in front of you and it's on the line, you actually oh, perform. That's got me dialed right there yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And then, um, you know, the, the other part with dopamine is you, you have addictive tendencies. So if your dopamine is high, then you don't tend to be so addictive. If your dopamine is clearing out really quickly, then you need to have something to get your dopamine up. And what is that? It could be, it could be alcohol, cigarettes, shopping, gambling, coffee. Um, coffee. Um, it could be hunting all the time. It could be thrill seeking all the time. Um, it could be sex. I mean, it could be a number of things to drive that dopamine up. And, uh, and then there's, then there's the, the happy medium one, which is in between fast and slow. It's just, it's just right. It's like the three bears, right? It's like the baby bear. And it's, it's just kind of the balance of the perfect two. But the problem is there's, there's other genes which also influence it. Right. So it's not that simple. But it's, it's powerful to know which one you tend to be. Because then if you know which one you are, then you know how to handle the situation. Right? You know which shovel do you use. And so if you're, if you're out hunting and you, are, you got a bear coming after you, but you focus and you're able to get that shot off or to use a spray comfortably then you're like, okay, I handled that well. But if you're out in danger and you freak out and you can't handle it, then you probably shouldn't go out in bear country. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's something um, I've always, I think, been very fortunate to have is kind of a even keel level-headedness in those type of situations. So I do think, um, you know, don't want to sound egotistical, but I do think that I do make great decisions when under pressure mm -hmm. at a fast. No, we've been in pace. we've been in situations where I'm like, I can't think, and he just like, yeah, we just takes cougar. over. We, had a we got confronted by a cougar, like, like all these kinds the of things. And he just like, especially in the wilderness. I mean, he's he's just like, bam, yeah, he just that is kicks my it element, in. and I I think clearer up there. I don't in the city. I <laughs> if we have to much. drive downtown Seattle, he's like. Where am I going? Which way do I turn? I bet What's comp, happening? Yeah, I bet your comp minus minus then. I think your COMT minus minus or minus plus. So I think you're either it's fast, your COMT is faster, or it's slight or it's perfect. Okay. You know, I don't think it's slow. It's just like you said, oh, that's me. No. That was faster. Because when you're in a city, there's so many distractions, right? It's, it's like the raccoon and shiny things. You know, you want to collect those things. But when you're in your element, yeah. you are on. No, oh, city's blow my mind. I mean, they just it's just too much. It's too much fast pace. It's too much stuff where yeah. Hill does extremely well. I mean, she's driving downtown within that rat race doing fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm like worried somebody's going to jump out in front of me. I'm going <laughs> to run over somebody and it's going to yeah. be a bad deal. It's just constant. So. Well, he, I, I would guess that he's a minus minus. That, that's, I'm a, I'm a middle. I'm a plus minus. Mm -hmm. What's your MT Jafar? Uh, I'm an AC. One heterozygous, both okay. Yep, he's a homozygous A. Okay, yep. And our daughter, oldest daughter, is homozygous A. We haven't tested the little one yet, mm -hmm. but um, I've got a bunch of MTFR snips. Uh, you know, I've heard that I am defective. <laughs> I'm 50%. I think I'm what am I 50% poor methylator for MT Jafar? Yeah, yeah, so. And I've got you both beat. I'm I'm uh, really screwed up on that one. But see, that's the, see. There's the language that we're using, right? You know, Sorry. yeah. My empty Jafar gene is is slower by about seventy percent capacity, maybe even eighty percent. But it's still functioning at twenty percent. That's so, what I wasn't. I wasn't able to wrap my head around. I heard you talking about that. Um, yes. Because all I had heard prior when we did the testing was that you know my MTF or HFR or whatever it is um, was defective and i needed to take something. well how yeah. we actually got into this was yeah, let's hit that. ryan got tested because he was really sick and mm -hmm. he couldn't get better and we did a bunch of blood work on him he had mthfr plus he had some other things but going on his cholesterols were low it, yeah. his hdls were low his blood sugars were high he's got some things going on there because mm -hmm. he was pushing himself constantly right. right so his system was out of whack his proteins were low like stuff like that. But he did have MTHFR. So that was part of the treatment plan that he went on. And he did get better. It took a while, but he took methyl fully and did the drop thing and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't really, to me, have 
his detoxification pathways, I don't feel like he's as burdened by that as I am. He has more gut stuff. That's his thing. Mine is like detoxification things. Like just one bad night of one thing, I feel horrible the next day. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm just, I don't recover well. He doesn't seem to have that. So maybe that's a variant in our MTHFR um, thing. But that's different. Yeah. That's different. So maybe you can talk a little bit about this. Yeah. So what was your question, Ryan? You know, I know when we, when we got tested and all I had kind of heard was it's defective. Mm. So I need to take this methylation. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, I thought that for many years. And in fact, it's still plastered all over mtgfr.net saying that it's defective and it causes this or it can contribute to this. And that whole website's coming down, by the way. And oh, is it? it's going to get reworked because I've evolved. You know, my thinking right. has evolved. And uh, so when you test your mtgfr, so you found that, you know, there was something different, right? So let's first talk about, again, the, going back to the SNP. So... There's what the general population has. The majority of people will have a no SNP in there. It's it's performing at a hundred percent. Okay, the majority of people. Now let's back up and look at Chinese or the Italians or the Mexicans. They have a huge amount of MTHFR. I mean, they have a very significant one. They for their function of MTHFR is down by about 70, 80 percent. So very high prevalence. Almost half of them. Half of them have a significantly reduced MTGFR. And you think, well, why in the hell would natural selection favor such a prevalence of this MTGFR defective allele, right? Why would it select that? And if you go back and you look, these were high malaria areas. And people who had MTGFR survived malaria. Hmm. So they were able to reproduce and have kids. Now, then you think, okay, well, how, why would they survive? I thought MTHFR was bad. Well, they would survive because MTHFR is at the very bottom of your folate pathway. MTHFR has one job, and that's to make what's called methylfolate. It's a type of folate, and you get folate from your leafy green vegetables and organ meats, like liver. And uh, MTHFR's job is to make methylfolate, which then goes into methylation, which does a bunch of different things. But if MTHFR is working slowly, then there's other types of folate, like 5-formal tetrahydrofolate or folinic acid, it's commonly known. And that's needed to make your DNA bases and your RNA bases really, really important. And your blood cells and your white blood cells. So you need that type of folate too. You can't just have at all methylfolate and supporting all of it to methylation because then you're not going to have healthy DNA. You're not going to have your white blood cells, your red blood cells. Mm-hmm. So you, your ancestors lived in an environment that was selected for to have MTHFR as a benefit. Mm-hmm. But do we live in the same environment do we, as our ancestors did a thousand years ago, 500 years ago? Hardly. We've evolved as a civilization or devolved, however you want to look at it, so quickly that our genes can't keep up. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not that it's bad it's different. So you need to understand that, yeah, I have MTHFR, it's slightly slower, that means my, I can support my DNA and my white blood cells and red blood cells better. But if I'm not eating my leafy green salads, or I'm not eating my organ meats, or I'm drinking a lot of alcohol, then yeah, that MTHFR is going to come back and bite me in the butt. But it's not, it's not bad. And that's the whole premise of my book, Dirty Mm Genes. And that's why it's called Dirty Genes. My writer and my agent wanted me to call it the seven deadly genes. And I was like, no, no, MTHFR is not deadly. It's, it's prevalent. It's been selected for. All the genes I talk about in the book are not deadly. And I said, it's, we're doing it a service because there's some babies who are never born because their genes were so bad in utero in their mom that they died in utero, you know, miscarried. So that's a deadly gene. These are dirty, meaning if we let this table sit here for two months and the window is open or not even open, it's going to get dusty. 
So and that's the cover of dirty jeans. It's a, it's a it's a dust. You just wipe them clean. You keep them wiping them clean. So if you have your bag of chips, you get stressed out. You have a couple beers, or you you're hiking too hard. You're chasing that deer that got away, and you're working grinding, and you're running out of food. Your jeans got dirty from that. But you can clean them up. You come home, and you eat a good meal. You get some good sleep. Now they're clean back up again. So when you say it's working at sixty percent, hills at fifty percent. How does that how does that affect us? And what what do you do? What's the protocol for that? Great question. So, if my genes work has basically seventy percent reduced function, reduced. So okay. I have a twenty percent capacity for my gene to work. You have about a fifty percent capacity for yours to do work. I'm just throwing out some numbers mm -hmm. here. That means you could probably handle, and we're keeping this really simple here. I mean, there's a lot more genes involved, you know, multiple interactions. It's not like you're telling me to just pull back on the on the string and let go of the arrow and I'm going to kill something. Right? It's, <laughs> that's that's kind of like what I'm saying right now. Sure. You know, it's not that simple. Um, but it's the capacity to do work. Okay. So it's functioning. It's just not functioning at, you know, full capacity. That's right. So, I mean, how... How important is that if, if say, Hill's at 50%, is she getting everything required from that? Genes do work. So if you're drinking a lot of alcohol, you're totally stressed out, you're eating processed food, you're consuming a bunch of folic acid, and you're not eating your leafy greens, then that 50% capacity is going to start getting saturated. It can't, it can't perform. Gotcha. But if you're sleeping... If you're living a good life, if you're not too stressed out, if you have a couple drinks every now and then, you're fine. Fifty percent's fine. But as a society, what are we doing? We've got computers in our pockets. We're constantly on the go. We're constantly looking for the next big target. You know, what can we do? What can we do? And and we're always on, constantly on. And so our genes are constantly working. They're constantly on. So when we have reduced function in our COMT gene or MT2 R gene. They're going to struggle, and if they struggle, we get symptoms. So if I drank alcohol back when I was rowing at the University of Washington, you know, so I'm I'm at the UW, I'm training like five hours a day, six days a week, all school year. That's intense. Lifting weights, you know, rowing is is a tough sport. Plus, I'm eating college food. It's not very good. Plus, I don't any I know nothing about nutrition. I'm not taking any supplements. And I had empty Jafar, and you know I get in my twenties, and and uh, my growing buddies are drinking beer. I'm trying to slam back a few and being all cool. Oh God, I was miserable. I couldn't do it. I was super sick, and I was super sick to to Roundup, and I'd be spraying Roundup all over my family's ranch, killing Canadian thistle barefoot, walking around spraying Roundup, <laughs> and on forty acres. <laughs> oh man, and uh, I was super sick. I yeah. was super. My blood pressure when I was 19 years old was 150 over 90. Mm. They almost didn't let me on the team. Mm. Yeah. I think this is a big thing that we see a lot of today is younger people getting more older people conditions, right? Yes. So, like a 75 year old person coming in with a 150 over 90. You know, their their arteries just aren't as elastic anymore. Blood pressures can tend to rise as you get older just based on, you know, you don't have as much elastin in your artery. But when you're seeing that in a 19-year-old kid, you have to really question, like, what is going on? Because it's, I think, even the medical establishment today has gotten so used to seeing this. It's like, Yeah, and oh, what do they do about it? Oh. Nothing. Give a pill. Or are they like, here, you need to be on blood pressure medication at 19. And it's right. like, you know, it's, it's so, uh, it's, it's just a, I think, a, a, it's like a picture of what is going on when a 19 year old has that. And um, I feel like stress, and I know you talk a lot about this in Dirty Jeans, and you talk about a lot when you lecture and stuff is, you know, I know you do stuff with autistic children and autistic foundations because they're so toxic. Um, their genes are very, very dirty from usually the time they're born, right? And mm -hmm. then the toxic exposures that they get, they get um, inundated with, and then on top of that, stress. And I can't, our children are healthy, like they're with it. <laughs> 
I can't imagine having an autistic child, right? The amount of stress that puts on the parent and then that goes into the child because you're like, you don't know what to do with this child. And it's like a vicious circle, you know? I mean, I think stress is a huge thing that we just talk about in the medical establishment, but I don't feel like we totally address it. We don't. We don't. We're like, oh, you're stressed out. Go get unstressed. Yeah. Here's my thing with Ryan. Sometimes I get frustrated with him. Because I know when he goes to the hills for a week, he's not on his phone. He's not on a computer. He doesn't have the kids there. He's not working. He, he's not sitting in traffic like he does for his job. So I know what he's, he's like unplugged. I feel like I can never unplug sometimes, right? If you don't go and purposely unplug, you have to. it's almost like you can't. You, the phone is on, people are messaging you, emails are coming in. You got to, you know, we, we work online. We have online businesses. You got to constantly writing stuff and creating content and posting on social media. And it, it's like, you feel like you never get to unplug. And that's sometimes Ryan will come home and be like, why are you so frustrated? And I'm like, because you just got a week of unplug. And I have, I can't remember the last time I unplugged. And I think that is a big piece of the stress too, is I notice it with our kids. Like they get on a device, like we were joking with a friend of ours the other day, like how fast can you swipe? That's how fast your attention span is. That's mm-hmm. or how short your attention span is, mm-hmm. right? How fast you can swipe. And that's creating a whole lot of stress in the brain. I mean, I can feel it. And the difference from when you and I went to medical school, remember, we were here and we were just starting to use like laptops in the classroom. I remember I got kind of my first laptop and we were using it. But even back then, I didn't feel like we were. And now it's just like pervasive. It's It's like everywhere. I can tell you as somebody who does get to come back from those trips where I've unplugged, um, it doesn't take long just to feel it. You feel that high buzz energy. You know, uh, you come home and yeah, I'm usually like, whoa, man, this is like some intense stuff going on just in my household, right. like a phone going and stuff going and, you know, issues. And it's like, um, just so evident. I think people that don't ever unplug, maybe they just become accustomed to it. Um, but it's, uh, definitely not healthy. It's definitely but, dirtying people's genes. Oh yeah. I can tell yeah. you that. Like I feel sure. it. I know it. So basically becoming aware of that and just knowing, I think you're, um, you know, what you advocate is obviously to clean up your genes. Maybe you could, you know, go over that. What, what are the biggest, um, takeaways from somebody who wants to do that? The biggest takeaways is, is that we have a choice in everything that we do. And, but first you have to know how things function. So the whole concept of dirty genes is, well, not the, the book is teaching you how your genes work specific ones, seven of them specifically. And when you learn how they work, then you know how they also stop working or stop performing at their best. And when they stop performing or they start getting dirty, they create symptoms. And as they create symptoms and you, you understand it's a signal, right? That something's wrong. So if your gun gets jammed, you know what's going on with it, right? There are certain things that you check. Yeah. And how is it jammed? How's it sound? How do you clean it? How do you take it apart? If it's certain areas stuck, it's the same thing with genes. So if they get dirty, they're perf- not performing a certain way. So we, our body gets symptoms and those symptoms translate and should be warning signs that, oh, my genes dirty. I have a headache right now. I just did that. I can't fall asleep. Why? I just did this and I did this and I did this. All right, that makes sense. And I teach you the simple biochemistry so you can make those connections and say, okay, I can't fall asleep tonight because I did this and this and this, which then just increased my dopamine, just increased my serotonin levels and my norepi. So yeah, I can't sleep. So what do you do about it? Well, I teach you how to clear them out. And I also teach you how to make changes before you fall asleep. So again, you have to understand your tool that you're working with first. So you're not going to take me hunting if I don't know how to walk around and, you know, walking with pointing it at your head all day, right? Sure. <laughs> you're going to say, hey, you point that sucker to the ground, put your safety on, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and no bullets in it. Uh, so the, learn how it works. Then learn how it gets messed up. Then you learn how to tune into it and how to use it. And then you start refining it. And it's... This book will never, ever get old or dated 
Mm. I'm saying that now until science <laughs> will just completely erase everything that I learned in there. But the reality is the symptoms in there, um, every gene is a major system of our body. So there's two genes for our neuro, uh, uh, neurotransmitters in our brain. There is one major gene for our digestive system. There's one major gene for our liver. There's one major gene for our heart. There's one major gene for our detoxification, too, actually. I doubled up on that one. Um, and uh, so, and then there's another one for our, our cell membranes. And then they all tie into the plethora of conditions and symptoms that we have. Because, you know, my, my writer and my agent said, you need to pick seven genes. It's like, God, how in the hell do I pick seven out of Yeah, out this of page I have here is 20, like... 20,000, right? And so it really hit me when I said, okay, I'm going to pick the ones with the most research, the most evidence, the ones that people can make a difference on and change, the ones that affect every organ system, major organ system in the body. And I was like, that's brilliant because now I can teach people how to take care of their whole system and tell them what those warning signs are and how to address it. And there's quizzes built in so you know if your MTHFR gene is dirty. So if you do a genetic test and you did it with 23 me and you run it through strategy, that's great. But what about the people who are scared to do genetic testing? Mm -hmm. They don't want to do genetic testing. Mm -hmm. Well, the book's brilliant because there's quizzes built in there. It shows you real time how your genes are working. Whereas if you do a genetic test like this, a lot of people will look at the reds and say, oh, my gene isn't working. It's red. It's, it's bad. It's not working. Right. Well, no, it just shows you susceptibility. It could be both perfectly fine and functioning because we talked earlier about MTHFR. It could be working at 20%, 40% capacity and still be fine. It could be enough. Yeah. yeah. With but your you, lifestyle. Yeah. But you could also have an MTHFR gene that's working at 100% capacity and it's, it's slugging away. It can't, it can't work at all because you're drinking too much. Right. You're eating a bunch of processed crap. You're not sleeping. You're stressed out. So you, you, people will get their genetic tests and it's like, oh, look, I don't have MTHFR. But you know what? They'll do my quiz, and they're like, God, man, my empty jar is really dirty. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be born dirty. It can get dirty. Right. Because everybody has these genes. Everybody. These are all them. genes that everybody has, and whether or not it shows up with a snip or not does not mean that they can't get dirty. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I've been talking with some really high-level researchers that make me feel really stupid, and it's, it's an honor to be around them because they, they – bring it all back and the so one of the researchers i talked talked with is dr robert navio and he was the first doctor to ever prescribe the full human genome test to someone ever wow. and it was to the founder of illumina which is the largest dna testing company in the world they make the chips for 23 and me so he prescribed the dna test to him so two high level dudes and uh and i told dr navio i said you know robert i'm, I'm getting really sick and tired of people coming back to me and saying that I've got this gene and this gene and they're, they're trying to throw supplements at it. And he goes, Oh, you, you're getting tired of SNPs, huh? I said, yeah. And he goes, welcome to the world of metabolomics. I said, what do you mean? He goes, welcome to the world of how your genes are actually functioning versus how they could be functioning. I said, yeah. I said, that's basically what I've been doing this whole time. And that's what my quizzes are for. So that's what, when you run a test for, on your patients, mm -hmm. you know, organic acid testing or digestive testing, or you're looking at your B12 or your vitamin D, that's, that's evidence of how your genes are working mm -hmm. real time. You know, you get a headache. That's real evidence of how your genes are working. You know, you get eczema, psoriasis, or, you know, that those are all signs of how your genes are working or not working. So forget the genetic tests. Right. You know, I've got strategy, which is great. But strategy is for people who want to optimize their potential, who want to go hunting and be able to see if they can handle the stress load. You know, if they if they do the genetic testing and they run their strategy and then they're like, they're comp plus plus, they got slow COMT and their dopamine norepi is up and their MAO A is slow, so their serotonin's jacked and they got empty too far. I wouldn't take them hunting, not in a high pressure situation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. You're going to have everybody get their genes tested now. <laughs> yeah. But the, you know, you could, or they could no have. Well, well you know what I am. Yeah. Let's see here. Um, I have two slow MAO genes. Well, what color are they? A green. Okay. Yeah. Those are slower. Those are right. slow. I have two of those. I have a red MAOB gene. Mm -hmm. And then I have a bunch of MTHFR genes. 
And then I have, what was that middle one you said? Oh, COMT. I'm, I've got two of them that are plus minus. Okay. So your plus minus COMT is perfectly balanced. Your amt Jafar will slightly slow that down a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So that'll kind of drive you a little bit more to mm -hmm. a plus plus. But you have a faster, right? No, you have a slower Mau A. Slow Mau A. So you have a slower Mau A. That'll also slow your COMT down even more. So by that combination of Mau A, MTHFR, and a, a perfectly balanced COMT, now your COMT is actually, by a functional standpoint, kind of more plus plus, more <laughs> slower. Well, that explains it because, um, one, I really like coffee, but I can't do caffeine. Right. I can do it if I'm not under stress. If I'm having adrenal fatigue or anything like that, uh, like coffee just kills me because I can't calm down. Right. Same. There's Absolutely. some weeks I'm fine. And then there's the week where I, I just can't do it. Um, and then the other one is uh, I do not do well, not finishing something that drives me crazy. And I feel like in the last couple of years, having a little one, I've done so many things that I didn't finish that will drive me nuts. So like if I get a project, I will, especially under a deadline, I'm really focused, but I won't sleep. I'll actually dream about it. I can't go to sleep at night yeah, yeah. because I'm thinking of, oh God, I screwed that up. Oh, I got to add that. I got to do this. So Ryan never, he goes to bed, he falls asleep. Never. I used to say to him, how do you do that? He'd say, just close your eyes and go to sleep. And I'd be like, no. And you have no concept, do you? Why she can't fall asleep. I have no idea. Good Real easy. Sleep. I don't know what your problem is. <laughs> <laughs> and our older daughter is like that too. She just goes to sleep. She's just asleep. Trying to wake those two up is insane. I am more like that. And But once my deadline's done and I've done it, it's like, then I crash. Mm -hmm. Then I go the opposite direction. Yeah, see, like I'm yeah. worn out. So I push myself really hard. It was kind of like school. I feel like school did that to me. I really don't feel like I had a sleep problem until I hit last year. I feel like I was trained during that whole thing not to sleep well. And I had a lot of stress during that program. And it just made me where I was like an insomniac. I couldn't fall asleep right. anymore. I couldn't shut my brain off. And you know, you hear that from patients. I probably hear that from four out of five patients. I can't turn my brain off at night. I can't oh, yeah. go to sleep. And they're all like entrepreneur, successful people. Yep. They own businesses just like me and they can't turn their heads off at right. night. And so I'm like, well, I know how you feel. When you figure it out, let me know. <laughs> it's all. That's and, the, and when yeah. I look at this, I go, well, and okay, you could, it makes you sense. could read her test and kind of basically guess that. Not yeah. Guess that, but tell that that's how she would be. Well, we just walk through it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, isn't that cool? Yeah, it is. It's like the Matrix. It's, when you watch the movie The Matrix and he's telling him where to go and he's watching all these things come down on that screen. Right. The green and black letters just yeah. following down. That's what genetic testing is like. But once you can read that stuff, I mean, I can tell you are susceptible to these things. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. So you can have coffee when you're on vacation. Yeah. But if you're stressed out, you better not have a damn cup of coffee because you're gonna be I know. You're gonna be nuts. And if you're working on a project you need to also start this. This is where naturopathic medicine starts to really shine because the the what do you call it the the fluffy stuff comes forth, right? Right. So you need to start accepting. Okay, this is how I'm built genetically. So I am built to be driven. I am built to be high performing, and it's okay that I'm not finishing tonight. It's okay that I'm not done by my certain deadline. What's important now is that I maintain my health and my sanity so I can spend time with my family, so I can fall asleep at night, so I can wake up and kick ass tomorrow. Right. And that realization is huge for people because the type A driven types who are genetically built like you aren't okay with telling yourself it's okay. Mm -hmm. You have to finish you have to finish. But if you're a high performer, you need to say, okay, it's fine that I'm not done. Mm -hmm. And man. That's really hard to do. Ryan and I have talked about this on the podcast. You know, I'm a future dweller. I never live in the past and I don't do very good in the present. Mm -hmm. And that's been my lesson is I want to be more in the present. And um, I... I do feel that. And it's really difficult to do that. I, And it's so hard when you live with someone like him. 
Cause he's like, when he's down, like he's down, like he's not going to, he meaning not down, like mentally down, but he just, he's able to just stop. Right. Yeah. Cause he's, <laughs> he's able to clear his neurotransmitters I out. I am like, how do you do that? How do you go to sleep like that? How do you do that? And he's like, just shut up. That's how you do it. And for me, you know what it is? It's exercise. So if I don't get exercise, I go crazy after right. a while and, and I'll go weeks sometimes without exercise because I'm just busy. Like I'm on a deadline. I'm not going to take time to exercise. I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. And that if I exercise, if I just get up and literally do like go out in the backyard and shoot, a, shoot my bow and run like three 300 yard sprints or something and do like 10 lunges or something, I feel better. Because you burned it out. Yeah. I yeah. burned out that excess uh, stress hormone. Okay. So, so there's... The first, I don't know, 250 pages of my book are teaching you how these genes work. Mm -hmm. And then we teach you how to, you know, do the basics and the fundamentals of life. Basically what our grandma told us to do, which we never do. We, it's like, whatever, grandma. Right. Right. We know. We all know what we should be doing. Right. We, we all know that. Yeah. Yeah. We don't do it. So I'm reminding you and I'm giving you a series of tools to, to make it easier. And then, you know, kind of a, a program because some people can follow programs better. So then you, you, after you do that, then you take the genetic quiz to see if you're slow CMT, slow MAUE, you see where you are currently. First, before you actually, I missed a certain quiz, the first quiz. So first you score where you are baseline. Then you do what I call the clean genes protocol. Mm -hmm. And then you, you clean all that stuff up a bit and the more compliant you are, the more driven you are to get that stuff cleaned up, the better. Then you rescore again, but a more involved quiz. Did you clean up some genes? Did some other ones get dirtier? Did you have no change? If there's no change, you might want to go back to do the clean genes protocol and really do it this time. And so, and if you, they start cleaning up and they start performing better and your quiz is looking pretty good, but it's still dirty. Then you say, okay, well, now I'm going to go to this, where it's called spot cleaning. So, you know, you can throw your, if I got grass stains on my pants, right? I can't just throw them in the wash because the grass stain's going to still be there. But mm -hmm. I can, if I scrub it out, and I spot clean it, and then I stick it in the wash, then it can work better. So, we, but we do the opposite because you can't spot clean the gene without cleaning all the gunk out first. Mm. So, if I got a nail in my foot, I can't just take a anti-pain med or, you know, <laughs> yeah. something. I got to pull the nail out first. You got to do the basics. So you do the basics, retest, and then you do spot cleaning. And the spot cleaning is where the real refining and the magic happens because the, 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 what your grandma tells you is important, but it's boring. Nobody wants the boring stuff, but I'll, I'll, you know, health is work, you know, staying healthy. You, there's never a cure. There's never a long lasting, you know, you, it's like if I take this supplement, I'll be good forever. Well, that's bullshit. You know, it's you gotta you gotta constantly drive at it. So the spot cleaning teaches you how to clean up your genes and when and if they're dirty, you know when to clean them. And you know they're dirty because you took the quiz. And you know why they're dirty because you learned how they got dirty and what the genes do. So it's this whole perfect balance of of tool for you. It's, 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 I can't believe it actually came out. I, I, I it's so exciting, but to see where you've come from there and, and having, you've been an entrepreneur your whole career. I've watched you do that. It's just so exciting to see where you are and to see the amount of information that's going to help so many people out there. I mean, it's yeah. just exciting to see people that I know become pioneers in these things because that's really what it's all about. You know, for me is just, is, a, is helping people. That's why I get driven. That's why I've always been like this. That's why my COMT can drive me crazy, right? It's because mm -hmm. I have ideas like this and it's ex as exhilarating for me to see my friends succeeding in these things too because you're just you're just helping so many people. It's so cool. Yeah, well, thank you. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm wired the same as you are. Mm -hmm. I'm driven. I'm type A. My COMT isn't plus plus, but I have MT Jafar. Mm -hmm. So it makes it more plus plus. And if I didn't get something done, I'd stay up till two, three, four in the morning to get it done. And then I'd wake up the next day and I'm just trashed. I'm groggy. I'm irritable. I'm pissed off. If I have caffeine to try to get me going, I'm, 
I'm even worse. <laughs> and uh, caffeine, I ne- all through med school, I never drank caffeine, ever, mm-hmm. uh, ever. I still don't. I still don't drink caffeine. But it wasn't until probably, I would say, two years ago did I really start changing my life because I really, st- all the research, I mean, I've read thousands of research articles and tons of stuff. And it does come all back to the basics, stress, sleep, lifestyle, food, environment, mindset, all that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've done high performance coaching or uh, being coached and trained and conferences and all that. And I realized that sleep is important. And we've been taught that sleep is for the weak and sleep is not for the weak. Sleep is for the strong. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing Ryan needs more of. He does not get enough sleep. <laughs> yeah. And I'm always harping at him on that. But I think it's because he's always had that ability, like I said, to just go to sleep and wake up. But I don't know, maybe he is getting more REM. He's getting more benefit in those hours that he we does use sleep. use something but... like this, the Aura Ring. You oh. guys heard of the Aura Ring? No. So the Aura Ring, this ring has an actual chip on it. So right inside there, you can see that. Oh, yeah. So it it monitors your sleep, it monitors your exercise throughout the day, Oh. and it monitors your readiness. Is it just, it's not a Bluetooth? It is Bluetooth, Bluetooth. but I only have the Bluetooth on when I sync it in the morning. But it monitors you all day, even without Bluetooth. And what's it called? Aura ring? Aura, O-U-R-A. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's a phenomenal tool, um, because what happened is I, I put this thing on my finger, and I went to sleep with no Bluetooth, my phone's on airplane mode. And uh, I wake up in the morning and I look at it. I had six minutes of deep sleep. No kidding. I was like, what in the hell? Oh. I had like an hour of REM. I was like, whoa, that's horrible. And so I'm going through my day. I was like, what did I do? I was like, yeah, I worked on my laptop before bed like I usually do a few emails. I do it again. I was like, six minutes again. I was like, wow, that's really bad. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to bed. I'm not going to work at all tonight. And I got like 30 minutes of deep sleep. I was like, oh, that's better. But still, that's pretty pathetic. I, was, I talked to some of my friends who've been tracking their, their health for a long time. Alessandro Freddy is uh, Yeah, British. I've seen his stuff. with. Yeah, Phenomenal. he's amazing. Yeah, he's great. So he said, well, don't eat past you know 8.30. I said, okay, that's really hard for me. So I didn't eat past 8.30. I didn't work before bed. I got about an hour. It's like, wow, that's really good for me. And that's actually pretty good. An hour of deep sleep is actually pretty good. You know, the hour of deep sleep, you get about three, hour, three hours of REM. So you have about four hours of real sleep. The rest is kind of light sleep. It doesn't really do much. Yeah, and then you have a puppy or a baby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Man, that and is fascinating. And then um, if, uh, yeah. so it's, you can dial it in basically by, you know, going on the previous nights where you didn't get them or you yeah. got more and that's right dial it in that way that's and then it checks your your heart rate while you're sleeping too and if your heart rate is because when you're sleeping you're really really parasympathetic your nervous system is is absolutely calm right so then your heart rate should really drop in the evening the lowest it should so for me my ideal heart rate is about 48 in the evening and if i'm if i'm stressed or not eating right or i'm not healthy my heart rate my lowest heart rate will occur later in the evening versus earlier. You're really healthy if your heart rate is the lowest it's been like within an hour of falling asleep. You just, bam, you're, you're right there. Hmm. And uh, if you are unhealthy or stressed out, you'll have your lowest heart rate late, 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 late. So it takes a lot longer. To it takes a lot longer to chill out. And then if you start seeing that your heart rate is kind of like 48, 49, 53, it's kind of staying up there then you know you're not doing something right. Hmm. And then you could also be getting sick, and your ring will tell you, you should probably not work out so hard. Now that is a tool. You are getting one. We're getting those. <laughs> We're going to cool. order them tonight, well, man. Sounds yeah. like everybody should get one. They yeah. should. Because it's, it's, it's like having a cop, you know, a health cop on your, your finger. Telling it, you you did something wrong the night before. Yeah, it's not, it's not slapping you across the face. It's to say, you know, your heart rate occurred late. Your lowest heart rate cord late in the evening. You might want to take it easy today. Well, what I see that doing is probably getting us off our phones right before we go to sleep. Well, here's Ryan the deal. Here's what's happened since, too, is since we got into this 
this business really is it requires a lot more work on the computer for me. Ryan is on his phone a lot, so it requires a lot more of him, you know, social media, responding to emails and <laughs> personal messages. I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous. And some nights he's like on his phone and then he goes to bed and he's on his phone. He's like, if I go to work, I don't have time to respond, so I got to finish. And I just, some nights I, f- I feel like it would be, it would be better, you know, we'd be walking our talk a little bit more if we just put our phones in a basket at like eight o'clock yes. and we're like done yes. because we don't, it's hard to even interact with each other. And, um, but it's hard cause we both have other jobs, right? So we're, and I'm a business owner and he's a business owner, you know, he's running a big business. I'm running a business. So we're on top of that. We're doing all that stuff. But I do know that on the nights where I just, I just come home and I just, after work, I'm with my kids and I just, don't do anything on the computer and I cook a dinner, you know, these nights where you come home and you're like, whoa, what's the special (laughs) occasion? And I'm like, I just feel like cooking meals. I got cookbooks out and I'm having fun. Now I actually, it's just, uh, she put her phone down. Yeah, it's because I did it. So then we've also done these things where we do these Instagram stories, right? Because this is the new thing right now, Instagram live, Instagram story. And I'll do an entire day of our day at home, especially when we had the garden, we'd cook a meal in the morning because we like morning meals. And I'm documenting it. Oh my gosh. you can't, you're like, hold on, let me take a picture. Let me take a video. And then we did one whole day. We did a whole Saturday of Instagram story. We've done a couple of them. It's exhausting. Mm. By the end of the day, I'm like, we're done. See you later. <laughs> like, And you weren't and even present for the day either. No, because you're worried about getting stuff posted. Right. And I see people, I mean, they're doing great and they've got great followings and stuff and they're doing it all the time. Like every day they're posting on their yes. Instagram story. So I try to get him to do it and I've been pushing him. You need to do this. Like this guy's doing it. And this, he's like, I don't have time for that. I'm not it's too much. It. And then I realize, like I'm getting to the point now where you have to pick your battles we we have a great community of people that follow us and if we don't do an Instagram story they're still going to follow us yep. and and I realize like I'm not really walking my talk when I'm doing that all the time because I'm not out in the garden I'm not cooking I'm not paying attention and being present with my kids my COMT gene is getting seriously dirty yep. because I'm worried about performing and getting all this done. Right. Now, Ryan, he's the different. His COMT gene says, I'm not going to do that. Are you kidding me? That's like too much work. <laughs> and me, it's not that. It's just, I'm like, I, I, more I work, more work, do more so work, much more better work. doing other things. I would yeah. much prefer go out and just hang out in my garden, even if I'm pulling weeds than to be on my phone or doing something productive like that. Yeah. Well, that's that's your meditation. That's your active meditation for yeah. as, I, as I get you. Yeah. You know, some Absolutely. people need to sit cross leg and go like that and say, oh, you know, you need to pull weeds in your garden and, and yep. go hunting. Yeah, feel like I'm doing something. Yeah. Doing that yeah. Way. yeah. So there is that balance. And I think that we are coming in, like you said, maybe this devolving point where we feel like we never turn off and we always have to be performing. And maybe there is something to be said about for our genetics, to support our genetics, to support those ancestral parts of us that remember what it was like to live back in a teepee. They didn't even, you couldn't even have the concept of what a supplement was or what a phone was or what these things we have on our heads are. And, you know, a car, like what are these things? And now we just take all this busyness for granted. Well, we have lights. (laughs) Oh yeah. Lights are, I mean, back our ancestors didn't have lights. So we're always on. That's the great thing about camping, right? That's yeah. why uh, it's like it's time it's to go to bed. To your natural cycle. Yeah, that's probably the biggest contributor is is artificial lighting. Yeah, uh, artificial lighting and artificial, you know, crap flying through the air with EMF and waves and all that. I mean, that's that's a it's a real bad deal. Electromagnetic, you know, issues is a huge pollutant. So I being. If we look at our ancestors 500 years ago, they had dirty genes for different reasons. They had infections. Mm-hmm. They get beat up by animals or you know neighboring tribes. Um, they would die from the weather elements. They would have polluted water or no water. They'd have famines. So they had either disease of lack of resources or war, or we nowadays we have disease of 
too many resources, right? We're right. overeating. Excess. We're excessively sitting because we have excessive information in front of us. We have excessive light. We were, we're always on and it's, it's just too much. And it's that on, remember that we talked about what do genes do? They work. They work. Mm -hmm. So if, we're, if you're working your COMT gene that's already slower and it, you're pushing it, it's going to say, Hillary, I'm going to knock your ass down tomorrow <laughs> and you're going to be tired. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's, it's trying to tell you something. And if you fight it with drinking caffeine, it's also going to come back and say, that's not a good idea either. Yeah. What it's telling you is, have you seen the movie What About Bob? I have not. Oh, you, you haven't seen What About Bob? Isn't it the vacation story? of? It's Bill Murray. Bill Murray. Yeah, we've seen it. It's an old one, babe. It's back from when It's when he's we tied to the mast in the sailboat and he goes, I'm sailing, I'm sailing with the wind and the birds and sea and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm a schizophrenic and so am oh, I. Oh, he's the schizophrenic guy, yeah. Yeah. But the, the prescription it. is, it's my favorite movie ever. Oh. And uh, the prescription is to take a vacation. That's yeah. the number one prescription I give worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. That's what I say. And I used to say it and not do it. Now I do it. Now, beginning of school, before school year even happens, I tell Elizabeth, my assistant, I said, you grab the school calendars and you're Xing out. Every single day, my kids are out of school. It's gone. There's no work on those days. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm nine months ahead here. My schedule is Xed out. My kid has a, he made districts um, for vars varsity districts for cross country. Um, as a seventh grader, I Xed out my afternoon. I canceled a meeting so I can go watch him run. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. You know? Well, that's part of our lifestyle too. You know, our kids are homeschooled, but they, uh, you know, we work jobs. The way we've set our jobs up is uh, so that we can be there as much as possible. Awesome. You know? It's harder in hunting season because Ryan has his thing in hunting season, but that's just, you know, time of the year. Come January, there's not much going on hunting wise, at least in our household. And so, you know, there's, we decided a long time ago kind of that was, it was like make a lot of money and have a nanny uh, for me because, you know, my income potential could be much higher. Yeah. And sure. I've worked jobs in the past where I was my ability to make money and I was traveling and doing all that stuff. And we just realized like that is missing this vital part of our children's lives when they're changing and forming and they just really love us and want to be with us and, you know, we just don't want to miss out on that. To no. us, this is this is another reason we started this project because we we want to share with people that you can sometimes sacrifices are worth it. And you know, we've lived in the same house twenty years. Mm -hmm. We've we haven't <laughs> spent huge amounts of money on fancy things and stuff. And, and we just to us, you know, it's it's. It's for me, it's harder because you probably see my COMT. I'm like, what's up? I want the house on the hill. But as I'm getting older, like I said. She's coming around. I really Man, don't want a bigger around. house. I don't want a bigger house that I have to clean and I have to spend more time on. I want a different place that's a better layout for four of us now because we bought this house. There was two of us, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm so happy when I'm able to look out into my half little half acre with a horse farm behind it and a mountain behind it and walk out in the morning and see my garden. Oh, yeah. And to me, that's like, as the older I get, I realize, you know, this striving for these things that we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, it's just not as important. And we want to be there for our kids. So I think that's so vital if you have the ability as a business owner to do that, like that's really what's important because what do you hear people talk about when they grow up and their parents weren't around it's regrets you don't want <laughs> to have those regrets i mean that's i've always lived my life like that yeah. i don't want to get to a certain point where i think back and um you know i could relate this to so many things that i enjoy doing but with the kids i don't want to think ah man i wish i wouldn't have worked so much i could have spent some time with them watched Paley dance or taking her on some trips or fishing trips or whatever. So I, I've always been like that. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't even know if it was a conscious awareness. It's just, I know that's what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. I know I don't ever want to go through life where 
I'm at that desk job in that high rise investment banking. I don't want that because I know I will kick myself at 60 looking back and saying, man, now I just don't have it in me to go hike that mountain. I don't have it in me to do these big long trips and I'm, but I'm doing that. I'm doing that as much as I possibly can. So I don't have those regrets later. Yeah. What's retirement? <laughs> what the know. hell is that? I don't know. Will we ever be able to retire? i but I don't know if I want to. I hear people all the time. I retired, and then three months later, I got diagnosed with cancer, and like the dart died or something crazy. So I don't know. Yeah, it's like why not live now? Yeah, and you know, I, it's hard when you're working. I mean, I know if I didn't work as hard as I was, as I am now, I would do more. I would exercise more for sure. I'd yeah. have more me time. Yeah, uh, that's a big one for me. Um, I can now, but I just choose not to. I mean, we all have choices, right? I choose to work harder than to exercise harder. Um, I still go for walks every day um, and, uh, you know, I ride my bike or something. I move. Yeah. Um, sometimes not enough. My aura ring will tell me. Say, That's you right. walked half a mile today, Ben. It's like, oh my God, are you serious? I'm scared, but my aura ring's going to tell yeah. me. Yeah. You got two minutes of deep sleep. <laughs> it will. Well, I think this thing is going to be a game changer. It's, I'm, I'm it's glad awesome. you told us about that. Yeah. Because I think... Like I said, dialing it in, figuring out what we should not be doing at night, um, what it's going to take to get us a lot better sleep. I think I'm already there, but for my wife, what's going to get her to better sleep? You had made some comment oh. that you don't believe in biohacking. No. And this aura ring is kind of like a biohack because it's telling you, you know, what your body's doing, but you were making a comment about how this new trend of biohacking and people are trying to get better through science, yet... We're kind of missing the boat, right? It's the term hack. Hack. It's the hack. I'm all for mm. bio-optimization. Mm. I'm also, I'm all for tuning in to seeing what our body is doing. Mm -hmm. But I'm not for, you know, seeing my aura ring is telling me that my lowest heart rate occurs late in the evening. So I'm going to hack it by taking a supplement which vasodilates, you know, or, you know, it expands my, mm -hmm. I'm not going to pump full of arginine or something, right? right. right. I'm going to make a lifestyle decision to change what it's telling me. I'm not going to hack it with a supplement or a, a, you know, a bunch of a certain particular type of food. I'm just going to change who I am and what I'm doing. Get That's the root of it. Yeah. It's, you can't, if I'm going to hack it, you know, I might be able to hack it for a little bit. But my body's got multiple different highways it's going to choose and it's going to come back and it's going to come roaring back and there's going to be the traffic jam or I'm going to get a speeding ticket. Uh, you know, either way, it's going to, it's not going to be favorable. Right. And uh, so I think biohacking is, is, is total nonsense. It's, you know, it's total nonsense. And there's Bio optimization. Big, that was yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Big, big platforms built on that, boy. Yeah. Okay, I have one question about supplements. Can you just touch on folic acid? Because <laughs> this is like the new stuff coming out. You talk a ton about how folic acid is poisonous, if I'm saying that too strongly. And I don't think most people understand what that means or like what even folic acid does. But if you look at a standard supplement, you see folic acid in it. Um, and so can you just touch on that a little bit? Because... Yeah. So this goes back to, you know, what's important. And, you know, our ancestors did not have access to folic acid. They had access to folate. Okay. Folate stands for foliage. It comes from the term foliage, you know, folar, I believe, which is, comes from foliage. And so leafy greens. So folic acid is not found in nature anywhere. Folic acid is not recognized well, folic acid does not do anything physiological in the body at all. There is no enzyme or gene in the human body which will take folic acid in its natural state and use it. There's hmm. zero benefit. The body has to change it into an active form of folate that the body recognizes. So my thinking is, all right, that's not so bad. But the process, the problem is to be able to convert the synthetic form of folate, of folic acid, into the body's natural physiological forms of folate requires work. Right. And if it requires work, it requires a gene. And there's a gene which is very, very slow 
at converting folic acid into natural folate, and that's DHFR, which nobody talks about. 23andMe doesn't test for it. It would be oh. on your strategy, and if I, if I could, we are making our own DNA chip as we speak. Oh. Um, it's a very common uh, variant uh, in the population. It's reduced significantly. And what happens is folic acid, people will consume it in their drinks or supplements or foods, and the folic acid will try to go through the DHFR gene, but only very little gets through. And since only very little folic acid gets through, that means a lot of folic acid is still there, right? And so what? That's fine. It'll eventually get through. Well, the problem is folic acid will is, is more recognized by your folate receptors and your folate transport systems in your body than natural folate. What that means is, for example, if you were sitting in the garage and your car was on, you would die from carbon monoxide poisoning, right? right? Yeah. There's oxygen there, but you're sucking in carbon monoxide, but yet you still die. Why is that? It's because your hemoglobin will bind the carbon monoxide more strongly than oxygen. Right. So your transport for folate and your receptors for folate will bind folic acid more than your natural folate. Mm. So what happens is your folate transportation systems and your folate receptor systems, in order to get natural folate inside the cell so it can do work, can't do work anymore because they don't have the tool they need. Right. So you, you can run a lab test and it'll say your serum folate is normal or high, but you're functionally deficient in folate. So you will have no natural folate or very little folate in your brain. You will have very little folate in your inside of your cells. And a result, a plethora of symptoms will happen. Um, you'll have anemias, you'll have white blood problem, white cell blood problems, you'll have high homocysteine, um, you'll not be able to uh, form various neurotransmitters. And also the, the real kicker is cerebral folate deficiency. So being able to get folate in your brain, autistic kids and people who have seizures uh, or people who are struggling with you know, neurotransmitters in general have cerebral folate deficiency. Hmm. So you, you have to do a spinal tap for them. You figure out that they're functionally deficient in folate. Folic acid is contraindicated in cerebral folate deficiency. Because they know... It competes. It competes. Mm. So if they know that, why are we still using it when we have natural folates is it available? cheap? It is cheap, but folinic acid is also cheap. Mm. Folinic acid is basically as cheap as folic acid. I mean, folic acid is probably, I don't even know, probably $2 a kilo for a supplement manufacturer to produce. Folinic acid might be 4 bucks a kilo. Right. Now, methylfolate is about $12,000 a kilo. It's a big uh, difference. Yeah. Um, but you can also eat your leafy green vegetables or you can eat your liver and get your natural folates. Right. So folic acid is, is, is horrible. We're doing a, a clinical trial now to prove this. <laughs> so, cause I'm tired of it. The research is there. I prove it. People keep questioning me. I just keep, until they prove me wrong, I'm going to keep, you know, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Yeah. Because the, the feedback that I'm getting from people stopping the folic acid supplementation or consuming all these foods, they feel better. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I notice I've kind of slowed down on supplements that have fall. I mean, I try not to take them if I can. I mean, I'll, I'll always look and see is there folic acid and then I mm -hmm. try not to take it because I just know for myself that. I don't know if that's one thing that doesn't, but I know it's not helping me. It's not helping. Especially with them THFR stuff It's going dirty on. in it for sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think that was, I wanted you to touch on that because there's a lot of supplement companies out there. There's a lot of supplements out there that are doing this. And so yeah. Let's, let's talk about that for just a second too. Yeah. What does supplement mean? It means to supplement like your diet, like to supplement, not to, it's not like your meal. It's not like. Right. To add, mean, to. to add to means to add to means to add to or enhance right so you you supplement with a supplement in order to add or enhance your feelings your emotions your mood your performance your sleep what have you your detoxification but it's the supplement it's not 
it's not the overall treatment. It's not the overall picture. You still need to do the lifestyle, diet, mindset, environment like we've been talking about. You still have to do all that. Yeah. You can't supplement yourself out of a shitty diet. Sorry if this is rated G. <laughs> I'm the editor. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but it's so true. You can't do that. And uh, it just doesn't work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, yeah real food. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we I mean, we are proponents of eating real healthy food. And I know with my patients that that's the first place I go. And there are people who do eat really well. Like, you know, I don't have a great day every day and I feel like I eat pretty well 90% of the time. And, you know, just based on my genes and based on my lifestyle and based on my personality, you know, I can easily probably hurt myself when I shouldn't be, right? But the the fact that I'm eating 90% of the time, I'm eating healthy like that, um, I've lived in the past when I was younger, what got me into naturopathic medicine when I was younger, you know, I didn't eat well. I was taking tons of antibiotics. Like I had a bunch of problems and that's what kind of led me to finding naturopathic medicine. And so there are a lot of people out there living like that. And, um, you know, they just, they do want the supplement. Oh, give me this. So I heard this show, I could take this. And I'm like, you can't do it without eating well, because eating is something you do every day unless you fast once in a while right you know it's it's not like you can exercise once in your life and never exercise again Mm -hmm. right it's not like you can eat one healthy meal never eat healthy again unfortunately it's something that has to become part of your actual existence it it has to be something that you think about um and you incorporate and the supplements you know why do i'm sure you have it too i mean you own a supplement company now but i mean we have a cabinet that I clean out every oh, yeah. single year and Me it too. fills back up with supplements. And so we know it's supplements because I don't, you, you know, you talk about pulsing supplements a lot and we kind of, we kind of do that. We take them for a while when we're doing stuff and then come summer when we have fresh vegetables and we have, we're not taking as many supplements, mm-hmm. you know, um, winter comes and we don't have all that stuff and we take more supplements, you know, more viruses are flying around out there. We got kids at school age, you know, like we take more supplements, but, um, those, that is a huge foundational piece Yeah, that I wish parents would understand. And really, if, if you're a parent out there, like if this is one key concept that you get about helping your children's genes, like start feeding them healthy food at least 50 or more percent of the time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. right like because that is what is going to influence them I say I was sick when I was younger but when I was younger younger my parents were very healthy and my dad was very health conscious and we ate very healthy and I went through a cycle where I didn't and we had a lot of stress divorce and all this stuff I think that was what really what set it off right but I attribute those young years in my life and I know Ryan can do the same because his parents were very serious about the foods he ate as a child yeah those younger years, those formative years where we were taught healthy foods, we had a garden, we, that is what shaped me now. That is where I was able to, when I was older and I got unhealthy, to look back and be like, what do I need to change? What I can fall back on what my parents taught me about a healthier diet. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, I know you want to help unborn children. You want to help pregnant women. You want to help autistic children. Like, if there's anything that I could tell a person, it's like, if you can't do it for yourself, do it for your child. <laughs> Feed your child healthy food. Yeah. Because that's, that's, that's you know, such a big thing. Yeah. And uh, and kids will fight you. My kids fight me. Yeah, but when they feel they better want, and they start yeah. talking, they start performing better. Yeah. You know, because I tell my kids all the time, my oldest is lifting weights. And I'm like, dude, carbs don't go in your muscles. I mean, a little bit of them, but they're made of protein. So you better start eating. He's like, uh, but he's starting to eat protein now because he wants to bulk up. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, my, Matthew, he wants to, he wants to perform in cross country. And so I'll, I'll provide him some supplements. He doesn't like the supplements. And, uh, I said, well, how'd you perform last time? He goes, well, I dropped 30 seconds. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I know dad. I, I won. I get it. And so I gave him this before he competed. Oh, adrenal cortex. Yeah, and I gave him the electrolytes and uh, the multivitamin, and that that was it. And he, mm-hmm. the kid, flies. Yeah. So because exercise is stress, right? right? 
so this supports the stress and uh, the electrolyte keeps you going as well so yeah that's that's um we uh, that's one supplement yeah we, we do, do a lot of there's electrolytes yeah. yeah it's um and he was always telling me to take some adrenal support because of my lack of sleep but uh yeah, electrolytes is just huge for me because, you know, you're depleting yourself by mm -hmm. these pushing your body to its limits. For sure. He's a sweater, too. Holy cow, he sweats like bam. Yeah. Sweat I don't sweat. It takes me an hour of hot yoga to sweat. Something wrong <laughs> with her. Which I probably swear. is not good. That's a sympathetic imbalance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you got to sweat that out. Yeah. So that's, that's why I always like every time I go to yoga, I'm like, why don't I do this every day? I feel so good. Right? Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, electrolytes are important. Yeah. Well, Ben, I think we've this maybe was, touched on a bunch of stuff. That <laughs> this was phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, I'm so glad we got to sit here and talk with you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. It's fun. Stuff. Yeah. For sure. And thanks for dumbing this down a little bit for guys <laughs> like me that can understand it. When you put it in these terms, it's it's great. Well, the the trick is to make it all applicable, right? right. I mean, it. it well, that's kind of how you've done all of this. You know, yeah, dirty yeah. jeans, clean them up. Yeah, and you know, there's there's no point to be a teacher if you think you're sounding smart and you're trying to, you know, puff your chest out with a bunch of fancy words. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not teaching anyone. So I, I think that a teacher is supposed to be inspirational and, you know, get people to think and drive change and take action. And if, if those things don't happen, then I failed. Right. So, and, uh, well, that know. is our first oath, right? That is our first, um, principle is doser. Yeah, exactly. Teacher. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the doctor's job is to teach. We're not here to fix. That's what people think. They think a doctor is to fix someone, to fix them. But no, we just guide you to fix yourself. So that's why I'm really excited about Dirty Jeans because I think it's going to be a phenomenal guide without me even being there. Yeah. So they can try these things out and legit fix themselves. Fix themselves. Right. And if they get stuck, you know, they get a serious infection or they break their arm, yeah, I go to the doctor and get fixed. Yeah. But, you know, otherwise, learn the fundamentals, apply them, go hunting. And lifestyle. Lifestyle. You know, change your lifestyle. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Have you been hunting? Have you hunted? I haven't, but uh, I actually, with Mike Mutzel, High Intensity Health, I was, he, he got two turkeys. Oh. And uh, so he was telling you, I think, about it. We were, he goes, you want a turkey, Ben? And I was like, yeah. 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 And so we were, I was going to go over and I was going to kill it and learn how to gut it and harvest it and all that. I mean, I, I did some of that when I was in Australia on the cattle ranch uh, station. It's not a ranch. One's a million and a half acres. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was a good learning experience. Yeah. But, uh, I definitely want to hunt because I want real food. We buy from ranchers. Um, but I, you know, if I eat meat, which I do, then I should also learn how to sustain it myself. And I think it's important for my kids to see that too. You know, we went to Waco's house, a buddy of mine's in Olympia, who's going hunting next week. And, uh, I dropped my boat off there last year and I couldn't put my boat in his shop because he just killed a deer and is, is cleaning it. And oh, he's got it hanging. Yeah. Well, he was actually uh, already, it was already hang, hung in for a while, but they were making steaks and packaging it. Gotcha. So uh, we had to wait till that was all done. And the kids came in there like, Oh, ew, yeah, gross. And I was like, no, no, I want you to come in here and look at this. Yeah. You know? It's, I think it's extremely healthy for kids to see that. Um, yeah. Paley's been exposed to it. I think, more than most folk and it doesn't affect her it's not this thing of yeah like like you said gross it's not this thing of oh and they run the other way anymore um she's very comfortable around it and um she sees it as meat you right know? it's it's sustaining us so she kind of understands that life sustains life thing at such an early age and unfortunately i think there's a lot of kids um you know around her that have not figured that out and it's uh, kind of sad in a way to me. It's very sad. And and how is she when she has you know the meat on her plate and she's full? What does she do? Does she does she throw it in the trash? Does she does she know? I mean, what does she? How does she handle that? Boy, I don't think we would ever throw it away. No, she I, eats it. She We've eats, learned her portion sizes, she but she'll eats eat it all. That we give her. Yeah, um, Ryan has a big issue with food waste, so I don't waste we've food. learned our kids what they'll eat and what mm -hmm. they want. We try not to waste food at all because we just... Uh, well, that's something that's missing is, is the gratitude and the gratefulness of, of having food on your plate. 
you know, because you go to the store, you buy it, or the you know, food's cheap. If it's cheap, it doesn't mean much. Yeah, and then they just throw it away. Yeah. So she'll throw away yeah. a. She'll easily uh, buy. We went to Mod Pizza one night, and she wanted to get this little. And they used to be like ding dongs when we were kids. It looked like that. This cake, and I said, "Sure, get it." She ate like two bites of it. She's like, "Yeah, this is so sweet. I can't eat this, Mom." Mm -hmm. And she's like, "Can I throw this away?" And I was like, "Yeah, you can throw it away." Certainly, yeah. you know. But she, um, yeah, she's pretty conscious of that. She, she's, she's funny. She's like her girlfriend will come over. <laughs> oh, this is deer. We're eating bear that my dad killed. And their friends like. You know, but her friends anymore aren't surprised. But yeah, she's yeah. No, she's happy to tell everybody. Her and they go out to the garden, yeah. and they know that, and uh, they ask for that, or you know, strawberries or peas or whatever. Um, she's not wasteful and on any of that because she's kind of been a part of it. You know, I I always have her plant a few things, so she's got her pot to plant in, whether it's a tomato seed or whatever, and so she's kind of a part of it, and she gets to throughout the year check on it. Mm -hmm. see how it's doing and eventually pull something off of it and um it's just i think you know she's eight but she's already very aware that that's the process of where food is how it's grown and nice. what it takes to kind of get to that point of being able to eat it mm -hmm. the other day she said mom because we have hens you know for eggs and she says mom why don't you make some chicken noodle soup and i said oh, i gotta go buy chicken for that and she goes well just go kill a chicken <laughs> And I go, what? These are like her pets. This is her job is to let them in and out at night, to feed them. I said, I'm not going to go kill one of the chickens. And she's like, oh, all right. Well, daddy would. And I'm like, no, daddy wouldn't. He's more attached to those chickens than I am. Yeah. And uh, But she's funny. Yeah, she's, she's, um, she's very animal loving. She's sensitive for sure. But she doesn't, she, uh, she understands that. And she takes more after Ryan with that. You know, she went bear hunting with him. She watched him, like, shoot a bear. I mean, she was there for the whole thing. She helped him skin it. She helped him pack it out 20 miles in two days, this kid awesome. did with him. Good job. And she's, like, woke up the next morning. She's doing cartwheels around the house. Like, she was so excited about it. Got in after midnight. Got very little sleep. But I had to get up early. And she jumped out of bed that next morning with very little sleep. And, yeah, like she always does, cartwheeling around and couldn't, she couldn't wait to tell Hill about the story because Hill hadn't heard it yet. Yeah, no. It was pretty incredible. Well, we're doing this year, we're sponsoring out at our property, um, Ryan's family's property. We're actually sponsoring a train to hunt, the Washington State one. Awesome. It's national. You can bring your boys and they can do archery and it's just a workout. It's, it's competitions, 3D shooting. It's a big community of people. They come from all over Washington or all over the country. Well, and, and it's sometime next yeah, uh, spring or early summer and you guys can group. come it really is like she said a great community it's a great yeah. for focus art paley does it she competes they have kids all the way up so all your kids would be able to compete if they wanted to and yeah. um, tasman can just stay on the sideline looking good you know wearing oh, yeah. his nice outfit or whatever yeah. but um it's great a great group of kids and um uh, people and just everybody loves each other and supports each other and we're trying to grow it in washington so we need at least 60 people yeah so we can make it happen nice yeah. very yeah. very health-minded group of guys um, yeah. mostly guys that are trying to get better more fit um you know if they're following us probably looking more into the nutrition and uh and also just they have a competitive nature about them and that's what's cool about the kids event that we that just started up last year it used to be just adults now these kids are involved and man you should see the competitiveness in oh just for sure Haley at eight years old but you they're know, all she sits friends out and she practices they with become me. friends she knows if she doesn't she's probably not going to get a medal so um you know now she comes to me at at the house and she says dad we got to go run to the stop sign you know, it's three quarters of a mile up and back. And so, um, you know, I'll throw my weighted pack on and she'll just run. But it's pretty dang cool. And it's a great feeling when your daughter keeps coming up to you saying, hey, we got to run to the stop sign. Let's go run to the stop sign. <laughs> that is neat. And she's <laughs> only doing that because she knows she's going to do better at that event, that train to hunt event. So, so she knows the work now will pay off later. Yeah. That's yeah, she's, important. She's, and she's I did my first one last year. I don't hunt, but I did it. I'm in Oregon, and um, I medaled. I got second place. Wow. 
Because there's only three of us that compete. <laughs> <laughs> the girl who won, uh, I wasn't gonna say that, but. Brooke, the gal who won first, she beat me by a little bit. But I hit all my targets no, in the competition great. part. I didn't, yeah. 3D shoot was a little difficult. I was just learning the ropes, but um, I, it was hard. I was like, oh. Ryan's done a number of them and I was always supporting him. And it was really tough, but the camaraderie and against, and we had a gal in our, division she never even shot a bow ever her friend gave her a bow and she didn't even know how to shoot it so we taught her how to shoot in our 3d shoot and then she did the entire like spartan race this woman like that's cool and she finished and she got third and so that was the great thing too is like she was not prepared for that and everybody supported her and helped her and ran with her and did it and so we yeah just, and that's what's neat about we it, love it you don't have to you know you go there you show up you see what it's about and then maybe you're not you know a competitor as far as meddling but you're competing against yourself mm -hmm. and that next time you show up to an event you're just going to try to do better than you did the last time and feel better when you you're doing these runs and challenges and shoot better than you did and so it's more of a competition. And archery with yourself. is a great practice in um, yeah, I quietening your mind. Yeah. For me, for my high C O N T, when I do archery, it really does help me. Mm -hmm. for it sure. Calms you down. Yeah. It calms you down a lot. And for another trick to wrap up with is yeah. don't eat so much protein at night. Have your protein in the morning, have okay. a little bit less in lunch, and have even less in the evening. Okay. That way, because protein is a precursor to tyrosine, which is a precursor to all your dopa, norepi, and epi. Yep. So eat less protein in the evening, have a nice salad. Um, you know, you can have a little bit of protein on there, nuts and seeds and maybe a few shrimp or, you know, a little bit of elk, but, you know, just a little bit, little bit. Okay. And then maybe you can have some quinoa with it. Yeah. Um, you know. I do better on some carbs. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, do that and, and see, that way you should be able to fall asleep easier. Okay. Oh. That's what I was going to ask. So that is better for like someone who can't sleep like her or yeah. pretty much better for someone everyone. for you you could have protein every meal okay yeah <laughs> and you can have protein every meal too but you just need less of it towards the evening yeah that makes sense yeah that makes sense for me for sure i i know when i eat a lighter dinner and more vegetables at night my problem is i don't like cooking meat in the morning it makes me bleh. but he'll make it or i'll make like a scramble or eggs and then i'm fine well, um, that's the other thing, too. Why does breakfast always have to be eggs and bacon? Why can't it just be whatever? Meat. Yeah. Oh, uh, believe me, in our house, we don't have always typical breakfast. So I'll right. come down, Ryan will I be have, making like a I have always steak wondered or that, something. Yeah. That's a great question. I've yeah. never understood why it has to be yeah. that same boring yeah. bacon it's, eggs. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like the, the food industry has made that in our head. Yeah. Um, but it, I mean, when I was a kid growing up on the ranch, we come up from cleaning the stalls and I'd put a whole pound of meat and I'd have that with breakfast and, and, uh, maybe a smoothie with it. Yeah. Um, you know, like an orange Julius or something. And down the, hatch, Julius. down the hatch, it would go. Yeah. The orange Julius with, was the condensed, what do they even call it? Oh, it's that? so good. We had one in uh, orange juice and raw eggs and stuff. Yeah. We had an orange Julius in the little town. I grew up in Bozeman. I yeah. don't know if it's still there at the main mall, but we used to go there and get orange Julius. Yeah, I never felt good after drinking them. No, because they're just <laughs> packed full of sugar. Packed full of sugar. Tons and of histamine. sugar. Yeah. And histamine. Yeah, we didn't even get into histamine Myers. Well, Ben, awesome. Thanks for doing this yeah. for us. Pleasure. And our really community is going to really benefit from this. If anybody has questions or wants to get a hold of you or your stuff, just tell them where they can go. DrBen.com. Yeah, DrBenLynch.com. Okay. DrBenLynch.com. And then there's a... There's a, if you opt into the email there on the, on the homepage of drbenlynch.com, there's a 26 ways to clean your jeans, like what you printed out, right? Yeah. Very simple, very basic, very applicable, practical information. Download that. If you don't want to get any more emails from me, just unsubscribe. At least you have that handy tool. Okay. So just use that and get a taste of what we're talking about here. Yeah, I highly recommend it. There's a lot of good stuff on there. Yeah. A lot of useful information on there. So. Yeah. Okay, Great. well, Thanks until next that. time. Yep, thank you. Yep. The Hunt Harvest Health Podcast and Stealthy Hunter LLC website 
is for general health information only. This podcast is not to be used as a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment of any health condition or problem. Any questions regarding your own health should be addressed to your own primary care physician or other health care provider. If you have more questions related to naturopathic care and possibly setting up a consult with Dr. Hillary, please go to our website at huntharvesthealth.com slash medical consults or email us at lampers at stealthyhunter.com. Please note, without direct medical consult, all correspondence is only a recommendation and cannot be considered medical treatment.